afternoon. Hello and welcome. You are with the um, House Judiciary and Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are coming back into uh, joint committee hearing to, uh, to go through bill language on S219. Um, and this has been a, a, a process of uh, taking a look at the language and, and uh, suggesting some changes while, while floor was in session so that we could come back and look at some other, um, some other language, um, another draft. So I'm wondering, Maxine, if you might be able to sort of characterize for the, the assembled committees what, what you've been sort of driving towards and what we'll see next when we look at the next draft. Sure, I was uh, during during the I don't know, call it a break, but anyway, um, I was working with Bryn on the legislative intent and trying to respond to some of the concerns that I heard um, in regards to a, a list, really a unattainable uh, list, and committing ourselves to too much. And when I um, when I looked at what the Senate had done, I saw that. Many of the things that um, that I had put in um, were were addressed in the um, in the Senate language or 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 partially addressed. So I went through it with Bryn, and um, when she's finished drafting, you'll see that, uh, for instance, body cameras is in there, and I put in the language regarding certification and accreditation, twenty um, first century. Policing. I know there's concern about um, how effective that's been, uh, and but also I know that um, that coach wanted to name it. And also, um, since coach isn't here today, I wanted to make sure that I advocated <laughs> on behalf of him because um, he he did take quite a bit of time to send this um, these findings. So so I think you'll see that I, I was able to. Um, Eliminate a uh, you know a number of the things within our larger list on the back, um, and then in terms of where we had the uh, um, the executive director of racial equity in terms of subpoena power and that that language, it's going to be something like um, increasing so getting rid of three and four and instead having something like increasing resources to and the authority of the executive executive director, hoping that that gets at the same thing, but. Um, and then, uh, and then some of them you'll see they stayed, they stayed in here. Um, also, for instance, the number eight, which talks about expanding uh, data law enforcement is required to collect. Uh, and I just verified this with with James Pepper. That's in justice reinvestment in uh, section nineteen or nineteen a. Uh, so. Um, so we, we still could have it in here um, because because I know it is important to a number of people, but that is that is being done um, or will be done. And uh, and then in terms of, for instance, qualified immunity, when we get to talking about whether or not we're going to take out um, take out the new crime, you know, I think we can address that there. Um, in terms of data collection on. on mental um, health. I know that apparently the Senate did speak about that. There's concern about um, about HIPAA, privacy. Um, so, and we can talk about that too in terms of the, the new crime, but um, just we just need to be mindful um, about saying, you know, that's gonna, gonna be done. So, so anyway, um, Green is working on that and, uh, but I'm hoping that we'll, we'll address concerns um, in terms of too much work, but also, you know, recognizing and naming issues that are important to people and, uh, and more realistic. So Bryn is drafting away <laughs> as we, as we speak. Uh, what's that? Um, just to jump in, I did just send um, the chairs a draft, a new draft, um, which I think covers everything. Um, I'm not, I'm not positive of that, but I, but I did my best. Okay. So if you're ready to look at that, I can send it to Andrea. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. In the meantime, Tom, did you have a question or observation on what Maxine was? Yeah, I, I just looked at who had their hands raised and uh, 
I beat Jim Harrison to the punch. I'm pretty proud of that. By about three seconds. <laughs> okay. Maxine, can you just repeat uh, what you said around uh, three and four with uh, being replaced? Or is, or is Bryn going to cover that? Yeah, I think, yeah, let's wait for for what Bryn drafted and we'll see it okay. there. Great. And then, um, and then I didn't um, check with Bryn, but Sarah has your language regarding um, body cams and the policies, section six and seven, I guess. Say that. Oh. I did, I did put in that. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't tell if that was a question for me or not. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. So you did put that in. Um, I did put it in that. Yes. Um, I Because I'm doing this so quickly and while I'm talking on the phone, I just want to verify that it's what the committee wants. So but I assume that's what we're going to do when we go through it. Okay. Um, Tom, are you good? Yes. Thank you. All right, Jim. Yeah, Maxine, thank you for that uh, explanation and perhaps changing some of the wording, I guess. When I spoke earlier, I guess I was a little caught off guard um, and didn't fully read uh, it, but I, um, we can talk more when we see the language that Bryn came up with, but um, this is, as I understand it, aspirational kind of a, you know, objective as to what we're going to try to get done. Um, but if, for example, um, you know, we can't reached a happy place um, on say the subpoena powers or other measures uh, to strengthen the uh, racial di director, um, uh, the director of racial equities position. Um, is there anything binding in here that um, would require us to do something? I, I don't think so, but I think I would suggest having Bryn walk us through it and and uh, and get your feedback. But my but my intent was to yeah, great to, thank you to, yeah to soften it and and to really make it realistic. Yeah, um, much much appreciated and yeah. helps from my perspective. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Yeah, Rob Leclerc. Um, could somebody speak to the six pillars of the 21st century policing or tell me where I could go find it quickly because I'm not familiar with that. I'll post it in the chat for you as a starting point. And I thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think is it in coach Christie's testimony that's online. It is. Um, oh, okay. I think I I think DPS has been trained to it. Can somebody help me with that? Nope. I'll I'll search around. Thank you. I just posted it in the just put a link in the chat box. That's helpful for people to the report. Thanks, Selena. Yeah, if, um, folks may not know this, but our um, our current uh, commissioner of corrections, um, I, I still call him Colonel Baker from when he was uh, at the um, with DPS, but he left Vermont and went down to the International Chiefs of Police um, to do um, to do training on the 21st century um, policing, and was very very involved and real leader in that. So. Um, as as he was when he was was here with the state police and I'm going back to years, but it's a nice nice connection. All right, so committees in the interest of time, um, you can access the next draft um, via email and I'm sure Andrea will get it posted up on our committee page momentarily, but um, for now, uh, you should have an email that uh, that came from Andrea with the latest draft attached from 318. And so, so Bryn, when you walk us through, maybe uh, 
Let's see. Looking at line 21, where I talked about additionally the legislative committees of jurisdiction, I think that's where we we put we started and pulled things out and put things in, right? Yes, that's right. I can sort of talk about where things went and I, I tried to do some highlighting again, and I'll I'll try and point it out if I if I neglected to highlight something. Great. Before you get started on that, just just in case folks are opening up the attachment and looking at it through Outlook, if you actually open it in Word, then you'll get the the line numbering and the page numbering that you don't get if you just open the attachment. So we're ready when you are. Okay. So um, this is draft 2.1 of S219. <clears throat> so we've added, um, as uh, the representative grad said, we've um, shifted some, some things around. So the first thing, first shift you see is at the top of page two. Um, this is discussing that the current um, legislative committees of jurisdiction are currently studying some of these issues, including law enforcement policies, training standards, and discipline. And then we've added including accreditation through the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies within the next five years and work on updating a model policy for the use of body cameras. So we've, we've shifted that to something that the committees are currently looking at. Um, and then in subdivision B there on line 10, um, as we talked about earlier, the, this sets forth the, the intent of the General Assembly that law enforcement agencies um, use community policing strategies, um, and we just added consistent with the pillars of 21st century policing, um, because that is where, where that idea came from with the Senate language. And then subsection C, this provides that it's the intent that the legislature continue its work on the issues addressed in this bill including when you reconvene in August. And specifically the General Assembly commits to working on, and then we, we drop down into the list of things that you're committing to working on. Um, so the first one is increasing the resources to and authority of the Executive Director of Racial Equity. So that replaces that um, specific language about uh, subpoena power <clears throat> and the employees that would be added to be dedicated to the executive director's work. Um, and then some of these are the same, resituating the Criminal Justice Training Council to DPS, that's the same as in the last version. Evaluating whether to create a new crime, that's the same as in the last version. We've taken out reforming um, qualified immunity as it relates to law enforcement. Um, that's not there anymore. Subsection four, evaluating and revising the provisions of 13 BSA 2305. That is the justifiable homicide statute and 24 BSA section 299. Um, that is a statute obviously in title 24 um, that directs sheriffs um, to preserve the peace and suppress unlawful disorder with, and I, this is a quote from the statute, force and strong hand if necessary. Um, so that is another statute that um, we've identified that may need to be revisited in light of um, the issues that are being addressed in S-219 and some other bills. And then Five is evaluating whether and how to gather data regarding the interactions between law enforcement and people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. so that's a new one. Six is, um, and this is where I tried to encapsulate um, the suggestion of the chair and, and you'll let me know if this is not quite what you were getting at, but um, it directs the standing committees to review the LEAB model policy that governs the use of force or the use of body cameras um, for law enforcement with input from the ACLU, RDAP, and the Secretary of State to develop a statewide policy for adoption prior to the effective date 
of section, that should really just say section six, not section seven of this act. And that's the section um, that requires that uh, the Vermont State Police be equipped with body cameras and begin using them. And you'll see that I've amended section seven a little bit. Uh, I tweaked section seven to, um, so that could still take effect on passage, but we'll get there in a minute. Are there questions about that section though, before I move on? Cause that was sort of a big one that you were talking about. Uh, Martin. Uh, so I think we need to be a little more expansive as far as uh, the who we're who we're seeking input from. Um, I mean, we don't have to list everybody, but you know, like among others or uh, in addition to other groups. I'm not sure how to put it, but I know that there's others that would want to weigh in on this. Um, mm -hmm including but not limited to whatever whatever kind of language just to, to make sure that we're reaching out as broadly as possible. Sure. I can add some language that broadens that to include just other interested stakeholders. Um, it, as long as you don't want to limit that in any way, then we can figure out how to make that more expansive. I think that's a good idea. Any other thoughts on um, on this section of intent? Okay, so I'll, I'll keep going then. So um, subsection seven there on the top of page four, that's the same as the language in the last draft. Um, so now I'm gonna move out of the intent section and into the bill. Um, and some things are remain highlighted, but you've already looked at, uh, including that, including the, the language in the data collection statute, page six, you, you looked at that in the last version. I'm not sure if you made decisions about that yet. Um, so I'll skip to page nine, if that's all right. Um, this is new. So this is the um, new category B conduct. The committee um, was had some conversation about failure to intervene. And so we've added some words there. So it's failure to intervene or report to a supervisor. Or maybe a supervising officer is a more appropriate term. Um, Representative Hashim might be able to tell me the most appropriate wording to use there. Um, and so now I'll, I'll move down to 2407. This is the limitation on council sanctions. Um, the committee had had some conversation about whether that should be a may or a shall um, for the council to take action for a first offense for the new category B conduct. So I just highlighted that to flag it as an issue for the committee to decide. Section five, I'm on page 10, this is the new crime. Could I just interject and ask a really quick question about just that section? Did it, did it come to us, remind me, did it come to us from the Senate with this language? Yes. Okay, okay. thank you. So, I'll keep going. Section five is the new crime. So I just struck that, um, but left it in the bill so you could see. I know that's a decision that still needs to be made. And lastly, if you look at the last page, or I guess it's page 11, this is section six, or section six and seven have to do with the body cameras. So in section six, I removed the language about deployment. Is that right? Or is that section seven? Sorry. No, that was section seven. So section six is just the requirement that DPS um, outfit all of um, the Vermont State Police with these body cameras. And that now takes effect on August or October 1st of this year. And then section seven, this is the, um, that funding language. This takes effect on passage, but I've changed it so it's um, that 
the DPS should include any ongoing costs that it can't cover in its FY22 budget proposal. Um, so the intent here, as discussed, is sort of to direct the um, committees of jurisdiction to continue to look at the model or the, the a statewide policy for law enforcement use of body cameras that leave this requirement on DPS in to take effect in October. So the idea would be that in August, um, there would be some consensus around what the model pol or the, what the statewide policy should be. And it would be either adopted by statute or um, some legislation would pass that would require all law enforcement to, to adopt um, a policy. Uh, Martin has a question. Um, I still think we need to take out the phrase and that the device is recording whenever the officer has contact with the public for law enforcement purposes, because that is broader than either the ACLU or the LEA the policies are. I mean, it's inconsistent with all with both those policies. So I would still strike that or recommend that we strike that. All right, Nader. I, I wanted to chime in and agree with that, uh, with what Martin just said, because, you know, when you're thinking about law interaction with the public for law enforcement purposes, is it you know, just when they're investigating a case or when they're going to buy a cup of coffee. Um, because, you know, if you're recording every single interaction like that, it's, um, yeah, I, I just agree with Martin and um, I want to leave that there. Any other discussion from other committee members about um, striking that last phrase? I mean, it makes sense to me, so I don't have a problem with striking it, knowing that we're going to come back with recommendations on a much more comprehensive body cam policy. John Gannon? Gannon? I agree with Nutter and Martin. I mean, it's inconsistent with both the LEAB policy and the ACLU policy. We're paying for the data. Anybody, anybody going to want to argue the other side of that or shall we take it out? All right. Take it out. Yeah, great. Away it goes. Mm -hmm. Tom? Yeah, uh, just another in section seven, uh, initiate the acquisition uh, of the video record recording devices. It, did the commissioner say that can happen by October 1st? I, I don't so know just if, he, if he had a timeline that that he can make that happen. So I just want to point out that this takes effect on passage, and we've removed that requirement about deployment. So, um, oh, and I didn't take out the word immediately. I heard that maybe that word should come out as well. Okay, but it uh, down below at the sections six. It, shall take effect on October 1st. Does that mean that the officers have to have them and are using them on by October 1st? Yes. Okay, so I, I guess I would go back to is, uh, um, can they get them by then? Can they get, can they have them in their possession by then? I, I don't remember anybody saying, I, I don't know it, if there's backlogs, back orders what the timelines are for for ordering something like that has that date always been in here the october 1st date or is that no new? it was it was august 1st in the previous in the senate version so so the commissioner has testified and has seen all this and even when we had august 1st it didn't sound like he had an issue with it yeah right right if, if he was asked but it, it, so um all right that, that makes sense um, and I had another question, but I don't remember what it was. I'll come back if I have to. Thanks. All right, Ken. I would seriously question whether he could, if, uh, the training and the body camps, I can't believe they're that readily available. I would think they're in, in high demand right now. 
I would I would be very concerned about uh, about that part of the bill. Just uh, just my opinion. I I don't want to see us set up to fail on that, you know. So I believe it's it was the testimony of the department um, in the Senate that this has been long awaited by the department that they have wanted to do this for many years and that they have it in the budget to be able to to secure the cameras. I think the concern was the cost, the ongoing cost of data storage and retention. So it's my understanding, um, and hopefully there's somebody on that can correct me if I'm wrong. That, um, that this initial phase of acquisition of cameras is not a concern. Um, and the training also, Bryn? That, well, I, I'm not sure that they've heard that, I, did, I don't think that there was much testimony, testimony on the training since there wasn't an associated policy to use with the cameras just yet. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so I, I did have a conversation with the commissioner a couple of weeks ago um, when it became clear that these bills were, were going to be moving forward. And he did say to me at that point that they have been intending to, um, to begin uh, using body cams across the Vermont State Police. Um, and so I think you're, you're right to flag that, Ken, but I do believe that, that the commissioner has already intending and probably already acquiring the equipment. Um, Tom Burdett. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I misread that. I, I thought it was saying uh, to, uh, to acquire and, uh, and, and put them into, uh, into use. And it's just, it's just around acquisition. And, and that, uh, that actually answers my other question. Thank you, Maxine. And I'm also wondering if that um, that last sentence, the ongoing cost of the devices that cannot be accommodated, and where we change it to FY22, if that also responds to concerns. Certainly satisfies my concerns. Um, Hal? Um, I just want to add, I remember hearing the commissioner say that the cost of storage has significantly decreased, making it affordable. So the ongoing cost doesn't seem to be an issue. Right, I suspect when we get into um, the data storage and public records uh, conversation, we will find that the more significant expense is around um, redacting um, body cam footage to protect the identity of minors or um, people not related to the, the crime that was, uh, was being filmed. Um, Kelly. This may be semantics, but on, on the, sec the part on A, section eight, referring to the effective dates, Section uh, six, equipment of officers with video recording device and shelf. I'm reading that as the ones that do already have the video recording devices have to use it as stated. I know that just seems like it's modifying the, what's mm -hmm. it? Equipment of officers with video recording. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, it tracks with the way that section six is um, is headed up above, but it is kind of an, a funny way to say that. All right, so committees, we have now gone through the bill um, and you know, I think it probably makes sense to go back with a more of a finer look um, from the intent at the beginning of the bill. Uh, so that we can be moving towards um, uh, a place where we can can vote this out of committee committees. So is everyone ready to to go back to the beginning and uh, and really take a look at this uh, line by line? Yep. 
Jim Harrison. So just a procedural, who actually has the bill right now? I was gonna ask the same thing because we weren't on the floor. It was assigned to judiciary. Okay, that's... Okay, so are, is GovOps actually um, taking a position on the bill? I was going to suggest that um, if judiciary has actual possession that we straw poll a recommendation on the bill since we've been working okay. on it right along and it wasn't clear at the time that we embarked on this process who was going to get position possession of which bill and what um, and which bill was going to be ready to move forward. So um, okay. we've been here all together right along. So perhaps when judiciary gets done taking an actual vote, we can take a straw poll. Okay, and then more of a procedural question. Um, if we were by chance to get through this this afternoon, do we get to sleep in tomorrow morning? You mean, am I gonna call you to a committee meeting at 8.30 again? Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have to go run payroll tomorrow morning. So uh, so I'm hopeful that we will get through this tonight. And Well, now I'm motivated, thank you. All right, there we go. Um, okay, so let's go back to the beginning and go through this um, on a with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> you hear my door slam? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So, Bryn, why don't you take us back through sort of um, uh, just jogging through the legislative intent sections. Um, section 1A is is mostly intact from the Senate version, right? It is. I did remove that uh, reference to the 2016 act that um, directed the law enforcement advisory board to develop a model policy. Other than that, it remains mostly the same except for that uh, language in yellow about the accreditation and also the last sentence, the General Assembly is committed to continually assessing the progress made by the state towards developing a system of public safety that is effective, equitable, and maintains the public trust and continuing its work to achieve that goal. That is new. Um, the rest is the same. Great. Questions, comments, concerns, edits? All right, moving along. So subsection B, um, this is also largely unchanged from the Senate version. The only new language there is the, is the language you see in yellow to refer specifically to the pillars of 21st century policing. And then C is entirely new. That was an addition, the, a house addition. So that is, um, taking a look at the specific work that remains to be done and that you are committing to, to do. Starting with when you reconvene in August. <clears throat> Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, my internet's not as stable, so I've shut off my, my video. Um, can we go back just a little bit to section one on the legislative intent. Um, the very first couple sentences there just, I don't know, it seems to me that it's saying that we have systemic racism and disproportionate use of force by all law enforcement. It, it, am I just, am I reading that wrong? It just seems like we're painting all law enforcement with the same brush rather than acknowledging that there is some racism and that there is some excess of use of force, but not by all. Do you have a suggestion? I'm not sure that I do other than, uh, is there a way just to, to say it in a way that acknowledging that there's concern there, but, oh. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for is, but it just Maxine, seems like we're... Yeah, Maxine's unmuting. I wonder if she's got an idea. Well, 
it's interesting because because when I look at it and, it's, and I don't see the word all in there. I mean, you're it's not in there. No, and, I know it's not. But I know, and 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 so. Um, I realize you're interpreting it that way. Uh, why, why couldn't you just after the racial bias, why couldn't you just add the word concern there? Um, Selena. Well, first, now I have a question because I'm not sure I understand exactly where. Are we back to the very first um, section 1A? I believe that was what Rob was asking about. Yes. It, and is it the is it primarily that sentence on page two, lines four to six? Um. Or is it also? No, I'm 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 under section one. Yep. Basically, um, the first sentence. Well, yeah, lines ten and eleven. Got honestly. it. I have the same reaction as Maxine, and then I think Ken was referring to the other sentence that I just referenced on the following page. I didn't see that as characterizing all policing as um as you know that that all police are exhibiting these qualities i think we're just saying we if we want to reform um them where they exist which seems to me a pretty i would, I would be wary of watering that down i think I was actually above that on uh, lines three and four, maybe addressing it right at the beginning. That's the title of the bill, which we can't edit, right? You can change the title if you want, yes. It's probably why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but, uh I, I do think it kind of starts there, though, or, or somebody could read into it like Rob was saying. All right. Uh, JP wants to weigh in on this. John Classic, for those of you. <laughs> Get back to my... Uh, I, I agree with Rob on it. In fact, I, I take great offense at it myself. The general, it's a generalization, but in line, line um, three and four, it, it starts by saying by, by law enforcement. And then further down, it also says the same thing. It, it may be just a minor change of words, of, you know, maybe just simply adding the word some law enforcement or something of that nature. But here is categories, it's all law enforcement, even though it doesn't say all, A-L-L, -L, it's, it certainly implies that. I think it can be very, uh, very concerning to me as a 37 year law enforcement veteran. Uh, but I also think it'll be a slap in the face to the police officers in the state of Vermont who are going to fall into this category. That, that's my Thank you, Tom, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I guess I, I, I kind of agree with Rob. And, and the reason I agree with it is, is if he's reading it that way, he's not gonna be the only one. There, there's gonna be other people that are gonna, that are gonna read it that way somewhere. The issue that I, I'm kind of having a little problem with right now is, uh, is kind of the whole wording in the sense that uh, General Assembly's work over the past several years to create meaningful reforms to address systemic racism, but I don't, is it proper to add disproportionate use of force by law enforcement to that? Because have we been, we really haven't done a lot with that in the last number of years. 
So, so what kind of went through my mind was after systemic racism and uh, something like and investigate the use of force by law enforcement, and, I, and I, it keeps the uh, um, it keeps the eye on law enforcement, you know, with the use of force, and and I think it uh, it alleviates the issue that Rob had, just something like that. How? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what I would argue is that all of our major institutions in this country are challenged by systemic racism and law enforcement is one of them. And, and I don't read that it's all of law enforcement, but it's the, the institution itself is challenged. And I heard that even shared by the commissioner. So, you know, we're not immune from it because we're small Vermont. It does exist here and it impacts the institution of law enforcement. Jim? Um, just a, a quick suggestion. I don't know if this gets at it. Um, my optimism, if we're on the first sentence, is fading about getting done tonight. Um, <laughs> so um, what if uh, on line 10, address where it says address systemic racism what if we inserted the word and address no not and i mean any address any systemic racism and disproportionate use of force by law enforcement kind of doesn't say everybody is using force disproportionate it says we want to wipe it all out if as part of our goals is that I'm not the English major here, but think about that. I like it. That that works for me. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Well, I want to understand if it works for uh, Hal. I had another recommendation, but but if that one works for uh, Hal, that that can work for me. Um, it, it it clearly connotes that there's something going on. All right, then, then I'm going to lower my hand. I'm good with it too. Daughter? I just wanted to say I'm, I'm good with that to make it any uh, systemic racism. I, I think that that's a good, good way to go. JP? Uh, you're muted. That too. I finally found my other screen back again. Uh, I like that myself. Um, it's very, again, a play on a ploy on words, play on words. The thing of it is, is, is it, it, get, it, it makes a point and it definitely gets a point across, but it's, but it's not uh, accusing every, um, every police officer of, of these deeds that definitely need to stop. Um, and, and, and I like that wording. I, I really do. And it, uh, I feel a lot better if we went with that. Mm -hmm. oh. I just want to add, uh, there's a difference between personal racism and systemic racism. So you could be a well-meaning, do-gooder, and you're, you're good to go, but you're still impacted by a system of systemic racism. So I think it's important to make that distinction as we go through this. It's not personal. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Jim, for that suggestion. Actually, thank Pat, Jim, because we know that wasn't your idea. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Can I just make sure that I have that right? You, The committee would like to add the word any before systemic, so any systemic racism? Yes. Is that right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so after that opening clause, then we run through um, basically a nice laundry list of the things that I, mm -hmm. uh, the things that we have done um, in recent years. So, and if anyone has questions about what those cross-reference, like if you weren't in the legislature when these were passed, Martin? 
So I just want to address what uh, Tom had raised as the other concern as far as disproportionate use of force. And at least one of the uh, acts that we dealt with uh, as far as the regulation of electronic control devices definitely goes to the issue of disproportionate use of force, the, the regulation of the tasers, in other words. So we have done some work on Tom. Yeah. Also, the professional regulation bill um, in 2017 that added a substantial amount of oversight of law enforcement's use of force. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so Bryn, why don't you keep uh, leading us through the, the sections of the bill? Okay, so can I move past section one, legislative intent? Or would you like, are we, are we going through that, that section again as well? Um, committee, we did go through this fairly, um, uh, in, in a fair amount of detail when we first started this meeting. Are we okay to just go through this quickly? Yeah, I would say if we covered it, there's no need to do it again. Great. Super. Okay, so I'll move to page four then. <clears throat> so sections two and three are unchanged from the Senate version. Um, these are the requirements that the Secretary of Administration review grants. Uh, to law enforcement and only approve those grants if law enforcement has complied with race data reporting requirements. Section three requires the secretary. Oh, I see a question. Marsha. So this morning, uh, Rep Gannon brought up the fact that, that these grants are, are limited. And I'm wondering if we ever came up with a solution or is that addressed in this bill? My understanding is that most of the grants go to the larger forces in the state and uh, very few go to the small forces. That is a, I, I don't recall getting an answer to that. So maybe it's a less effective um, carrot or stick, if you will. Um, Selena has a, yeah, I don't think we we came up with um, a solution to that other than acknowledging the limitations. But I will note in my quick scan of S-124, I think they've done some more work around compliance with this issue. Um, oh boy, now I'm trying to remember what the stick was, but I remember thinking it was a lot stronger than this. So I think there's some other proposals coming forward in future legislation. Um, I think it had to do actually with accrediting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. All right. Shall we keep going? Okay. I'll move on to section four then. So this is the data collection statute. Um, We've made a few changes here, um, including expanding the data that's required to be collected to include the grounds for a search if a search takes place. And the other change that you've made is if you scroll down to page six, subsection four, this is the requirement that the data be um, you, there was a, as it came over from the Senate, there was a requirement that the data be user friendly when it's posted for the public to review. And you've changed that to clear, understandable, and analyzable to a reasonably prudent person. So that's new. Right. So we're using a tort, we're using a very legal term to describe something that's supposed to be understandable. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I would like to not have the reasonably prudent person standard in there. So maybe if we go back to clear and understandable or understandable, uh, which I know Hal had recommended, uh, took out an analyzable. And so uh, I think, I think understandable if people are okay with that. Anyone want to weigh in on that? 
Can you just tell me again yeah. where you're just getting rid of the to a reasonably prudent person? Well, right now it says and clear, understandable, and analyzable to a reasonably prudent person. I think just, you know, understandably. Um, John Gannon? I agree with Maxine. I think we can get rid of the reasonably prudent person. I mean, I spent a semester in torts trying to figure out what the reasonable prudent person was. I'm not sure I know now. It's harder than where's Waldo, right? So I would just note that it, the statute already requires that the data be analyzable. So perhaps we want to, you, the, it's the committee's desire to leave analyzable where it is. You see it's struck out there on line 14. So it would read data shall be posted electronically in a manner that is analyzable and accessible to the public on the receiving agency's website and clear and understandable. Is that is that where? It does for me. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to have it analyzable because that data has to be able to go to other places besides just the crime research group. Uh, and that's been one of the complaints about the data is that it's not necessarily as analyzable as it should be. So I think we have to keep that. Yep. And the prudent, the prudent person may not be qualified to do an analysis on it. So. <laughs> All right. So I think, Bryn, you've got it. We're going to leave the is analyzable and accessible on the, to the public on the receiving agency's website and clear and understandable. Yeah, it can. I mean, you could also just take out the reasonably, reasonably prudent person and leave it as has to be yep. accessible clear, understandable, and analyzable, if that works for everybody. Okay. Sound good? Sure. I, I kind of liked where it was analyzable and accessible myself. I think that that's a better place for it, for it frankly. Okay. I agree with you on that, Martin. Every once in a while, Tom, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm enough so hell hasn't froze over, though. <laughs> All right, shall we continue? Okay, let's see. So physical force as used in this subsection, you've changed that definition a bit um, to provide that it's any force that constitutes a greater amount of force than handcuffing a compliant person. So you've removed all of those terms of art uh, that were in the Senate version. Made that more sort of just layperson language there. And then the next change you're going to see on page nine. So now we're in the section that deals with uh, professional unprofessional conduct. <clears throat> so this is the two new categories of unprofessional conduct that are considered category B conduct. So you've added some words there. So it would be category B conduct to fail to intervene or report to a supervisor when the officer observes another officer using a prohibited restraint. So I think that supervisor is the appropriate term, but um, Representative Hashim will correct me if there's a better word for that. I think that works well, and it doesn't narrow things down too much. I mean, if somebody sees their sergeant um, using excessive force, then they can't go to their sergeant, but they can go to their lieutenant, who is still technically a supervisor. Uh, so I, I think supervisor covers all the bases. Barbara? Hello. Um, it sounds like you guys got everything figured out while I was at the doctor. Yay. So um, I'm wondering about adding um, failure to call or administer medical care as a, one of the A's or B's or C's 
Um, the other one I wondered about, and it would be part of the body cam thing is failure to have your body camera on when, you know, yeah, I don't know when, but, but violating the, the body cam uh, policy because it, again, I know we've seen in other states, lo and behold, the body camera wasn't on when something went down, but the calling 911 or failing to call 911 seems big to me. I would imagine that we are, um, we are gonna need to consider the issue of body cam policy as a whole when we're working on refining and, and recommending that body cam policy. Um, and we should certainly flag that as a, a place where we might want to have some consequences. And what about either administering first aid or calling for aid in the part about reporting hmm. to your supervisor hmm. or in that section at least two different things and again it might just be that's yeah. i don't know <laughs> i'll stop talking um bob hoopers I'm wondering why in G it's discretionary, why there's an or there as opposed to an and, Brent? True. My understanding is that's what the committee asked for. Where is that, where, where is that and and or we're talking about? Failing to intervene or report to a supervisor. Failure to so you're it's a two count thing. Is that what we're saying? The expectation is that you would do both, but you can get nailed for either one of them. Is that the or? Um well I think I think the conversation that we were having before is uh well I think it might have been John Gannon or Nodder who were talking about certain scenarios where um you might arrive on the scene um to see something happening that that you don't necessarily have to intervene in because it stops right away um but that you might want to report might what you might want to oblige officers to report anybody want to jump in with a thought on that that that's basically um it uh you know not, there's not not every <clears throat> not every scenario will a cop be able to reasonably intervene um, depending on what's happening but you know a moment or two later when they realize that what they observed was wrong and um, they need to do something then there's still that kind of backup plan in the statute which is that they are required to go and report it um, in that circumstance we were talking about before, when you roll up to a scene and you see a fellow officer on the ground uh, tussling with somebody, I doubt it is a circumstance where you're going to stop and say, ooh, what? Um, you'll be beating feet over there to get involved. Um, that's what I wanted to say before on that one. Um, I, again, I'll, I'll repeat, I think what I said before, this sort of puts discretion in the hand of the, the person that's witnessing it rather than the supervisory structure that's responsible in this scenario for making determination. So if making a report is discretionary, then it seems to defeat the purpose a little bit. And it might be that English is not my primary language either. Thank you. Maxine? Yeah, I, I'm wondering if, if intervene is broad enough to encompass reporting. I, I don't know, I think, and I, I, I think the use of intervene is intentional or was intentional. Uh, 
I actually also had my hand up because um, back on uh, page two, um, I just, there was something that, um, that didn't make it in there that I didn't notice. And, and actually Barbara asked me a question that jogged my memory. So um, the word transparency back on um, page two, line six. Um, let's see, sorry. Increase accountability and transparency in policing was something that I, I had suggested. So, sorry that I, I didn't catch it earlier. That but seems like a reasonable addition to me. Anybody have uh, an objection to that or want to argue about the placement no. that word? No, it's a perfect place for it. Yeah. I'm not looking at it. What was it again and where, Maxine, on page two? Page two, line six. It now says accountability in policing. So accountability and transparency. Or transparency and, and ability. I just, I wanted to get the word transparency in there because um, I heard that in our um, from the testimony. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, all right, intervene or report. Back to the question at hand. Um, Maxine, did you have any epiphanies on that one or should I jump to the next hand? Nope, jump. <laughs> all right, Nader, what do you have? So, I mean, the question is still is, why are we having the word or in there? Is that really the crux of the question that we're facing? That was my question is whether it should be and. If you see something, should you report it since it's not necessarily a decision for the line troop to make? I mean, I, I, I think that the way it's written right now uh, makes the most sense because, you know, we have these two possibilities in which an officer may be observing an excessive use of force and knows 100% that his fellow cop is messing up and violating someone's civil rights and he is required to intervene. And it's not like that sort of incident would slip under the radar. I mean, ultimately, you know, if, if you notice another cop breaking the law, it's going to find its way to a supervisor. Um, yeah. Well, if I might interrupt, I mean, that's why we have, uh, you know, a month worth of kind of riots. The only reason I think that the Floyd thing made it so quickly was that somebody else was doing video of it. Um, that, I mean, I, I'll say it right out. The thin blue line still exists in a lot of places and we don't know where. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that as much as possible, it doesn't exist here. Does that so make sense? This is about um, 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 professional conduct review for failing to report or for failing to intervene, uh, whichever might have been appropriate. I mean, it's not, to me, this is, um, this is a, a unprofessional conduct, uh, you know, after the fact where you, you, you're going back and asking whether an officer had failed to intervene or whether they had failed to report. So I, I guess I'm comfortable with the way it's phrased. Um, and Nader, if you wanna jump back in with another thought or I'll just go to the next person. I'm, I'm also thinking of, you know, let's say an officer is watching somebody else's video, um, you know, after an incident and 
or, or maybe the cop is seeing pictures that were taken of somebody after a use of force and the cop thinks to himself that something doesn't look right about that. I think that, you know, th there's no reason that this person should have two black eyes, you know, over, over, over such a simple thing. So maybe I'll go talk to my boss about it because I know that that's a requirement by law. But then if you're incorporating and into this language, would it put them in an impossible position where they somehow have to intervene in something that they can't intervene in because it's already been done? Or am I just, or maybe, maybe I'm not making sense, but that, that, that might be an issue. Tim Harrison? Uh, I, I think I understand uh, Nader's concern, and I'm fine with the language that's there. If you wanted to wordsmith it, and maybe what he just mentioned uh, wouldn't apply, but um, you could say intervene when appropriate and report to a supervisor. So if you just arrived on this scene, it may not be appropriate to intervene. And I think that's the area of concern that you just can't rush the judgment because you don't know what's going on. Is that help at all or does that just make it more muddy? I, th I think that might have potential to make it a bit more muddy because then the question arises when is it appropriate? You know, if it's my boss beating somebody up and we have a strict uh, command or rank structure, you know, I have to listen to my boss and he's beating somebody up, so it's not appropriate for me to intervene. So I, I think okay. that could potentially muddy things. Okay, then then I, um, I, I guess I'd be inclined to leave it as is unless someone's got um, a magic word you can throw in. Well, we have some little blue hands up, so let's see. Tom. Thank you. Um, no, that's why I, I like to have you in here. You, you came up with that scenario of seeing a picture or a video, um, it, and it'd be impossible to intervene at that point. <clears throat> and, uh, and I think when we put that or in there, it was, it was purpose. It was purposeful. And, and I'll, I'll throw myself into a... If, I, if I'm a rookie, just out of the academy, it's my first day, I'm with somebody that's, uh, you know, got 15 years of experience. I'm not intervening. It's just, just the way it works. I'm a, I'm a subordinate at that point, and, uh, and, and you just don't intervene. But, uh, you know, after the fact, and yes, terrible things could happen, you know, if I didn't, but, uh, uh, but I still would have a uh, an opportunity to to report to a supervisor what happened and i also like to think where if some where, that you said not or about if somebody saw something in a picture or a video uh, they would still be able to to report to a supervisor and i can i can see those opportunities increasing a lot with, with body cams i mean there's going to be much more video to that people are going to be looking at and potentially to see these uh, situations that need to be stopped, basically. Al? Uh, I wonder if and or would address Bob's concern about discretion, or does that make it even more complicated? Works for me. Uh, All right, let's flag that for ledge council and or <laughs> is that violating any um, drafting conventions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, there's a way. There's a way we can yeah. do it though. Um, yeah. It just is a little long and convoluted, but you can. We can get there. Does and or change it though? Does it really change it anything from being just an or? That's my question. I think and or is just or. It's, I think effectively, no. If I can chime in, I mean, if if one cop is intervening and preventing another cop from choking somebody out or just beating the crap out of them for fun, 
that I can only imagine is going to get it find its way back to a supervisor. So, you know, if, if an intervention happens, but, but then again, I also don't want to assume, you know, things, there are ways that sometimes things can get swept under a rug. Um, so on that now, now I'm not sure. So maybe and or is the best way to go. Well, you, there's some sort of way to do that. I, you all are, are looking at the intervene part and that's really not what I care about. It's the, none of this system works unless the report gets made. No deport at this time seems to be discretionary under this language. That's sort of my whole point. And that's the last I will say. All right, let's hear from a couple other folks and then um, we can decide whether we wanna take the long and convoluted route that Bryn has to achieve that. Um, Ken has his hand up. So, so sorry to do this, but you have an, another officer in there. Shouldn't you have another officer or officers? There's a lot of times there's, there's more than one that's involved in that, right? Shouldn't we cover ourselves on that? Yeah, I mean, there could be multiple officers um, on the same scene. Um, so when do you want to hold those all accountable? They, they would be all accountable under this language. Each officer is an individual officer. It doesn't preclude every officer that's there from being responsible under this policy. But you don't have to put a plural, plural to capture everybody, I'm, I'm quite sure. Brand, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Every officer who, who. All right, Martin. So the one other way we can deal with this, and, and frankly, I think it's fine. And I think that is uh, that <laughs> this provides an obligation to do both or one or the other. Uh, but we could just have a, an H uh, and have H separate as a failing to report to a supervisor with the rest of it. You know, one of them is failure to intervene and we have separate out one is a failure to report. Hmm. Okay. I mean, if there's any ambiguity that would, I think that would make it clear. I like that suggestion, John Gannon. That would work. And I just point out, you know, these are examples of professional misconduct. Um, you know, if you read the category B definition, it, it includes also violating state policy or the local law enforcement's policies. So that's going to capture this conduct in, in many instances anyway. Um, so I think this is just setting out examples. So I think we're getting a little too caught up in and and or, but that's. Thank you, John Kelly. Uh, John Baby to it. I'm all set. Okay. All right. What's the what's the sense? Jim. So if you put it in a separate uh, letter, does that go back to the original wording that Nader had a concern about you just arrived on the scene I, my, my view is that well let's ask Nader, but that there, there's a judgment call I mean if they arrive on the scene and they haven't intervened and they and and they are called out for that part of the whole process of the investigation into whether there was a reason to not intervene, which was I just arrived there and I didn't know what was going on, that would come out through the investigation. So, I mean, I think we need to keep it pretty solid that at least it gets to the investigation point if somebody arrives in that kind of situation. That would be my view. Okay, thank you. Okay. Do we have clarity on how to move forward on this, folks? <laughs> no. <laughs> if we're going with an H, we have clarity. 
if we're not going with the nature, then I don't know where we're going. All right. Are, are people feeling comfortable with separating out G um, into two sections? Uh, yeah. can, it, can it be repeated one more time? If Martin could go over it again. I'll have Bryn do it to make sure that Bryn is uh, all on top of what we're saying. Okay. So as I understand it, you want to add a new category of um, category B conduct. And that would be failure to report to a supervisor if the officer observes another officer placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. And that that would also do, I'm assuming that you also want that to be carved out of the limitation that the council has for imposing a sanction on a first offense. Um, that would be in the. That would be consistent with what the Senate mm -hmm. has done, even though I've. That would make it consistent with how you're treating a failure to intervene as well. So I do have, I hate to bring this up at this point, but I will real quickly, hopefully, because I know that uh, Jim wants to make sure he doesn't have to come in tomorrow morning. But I, I asked, or I was wondering with the, with this, the Senate, um, why they limited that exception on 2407 to uh, only these new E or this new F and G and why they wouldn't have included C and D, the excessive use of force and the biased enforcement. And I heard that they that this was being considered by Gov Senate GovOps and presumably in S124. And I'm wondering if that if they, in fact, ever really did address that. And I don't know if you know that or not, Bryn. I don't <laughs> think, so I wasn't in Senate GovOps for the, all that testimony because I didn't work on that bill. Um, but it's my understanding from the chair of the GovOps committee, because she's also on the Judiciary Committee, that they were hearing testimony about it. And part of what they did uh, was to remove, it was to make it a requirement that a first offense of excessive use of force could be considered by the council for a sanction. Um, so that was part of what they did. Um, okay, so that has been done elsewhere. It, it has. That's also done in this bill. It's, oh, did I miss that somehow? I probably it's, did. It's it's a little it's a little strange because what it in the original and existing law you'll What's see it? this on i think it's on i think it's on Sorry, page, six. page six page six i think oh, hold on let me just find it again it's at the it's at, sorry it's on page eight now bottom of page eight under existing law Category B conduct, excessive use of force um, is excessive use of force is considered category B conduct only if it's a second offense. So they changed that to okay. first. All right. That's and so the, that, that change was also made here just for consistency's sake. Okay, so how does that uh, read into or affect 2407? Does that, I'm just a little confused. So so excessive use of force, if it's a second offense. Yeah, like it's a little, it often comes as a All right, I'm sorry. So that's, can you hear me? Because I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. Uh, no, I hear, I hear you. Okay. It is for us. Uh, so if you can hear me, um, that limitation in 2407, it doesn't carve out the excessive use of force category of misconduct. So it's still true that if it's a if an officer commits excessive use of force. Um, the council shall take no action for a first offense. But but it will, but it may take action if it's a uh, prohibited restraint or the failure to intervene. For a first offense of one of those, yes. So I don't see how that, that if that's the solution that 
uh, Senator White came up with. I don't see how that is a solution because again, it seems like excessive force, whether it's first offense or whatever, that there should be an option because it's equivalent to using a prohibited restraint in my view or failure to intervene. Right, I'm not making a commentary on no, whether or not- No, I'm no, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I um, guess that was more of a, a a comment to the rest of the folks here. I, I know that's a policy decision, but it doesn't seem that that resolves that issue. And, and maybe it's too no. late to, to make that change, but but uh, that is something that I brought up before that I thought that uh, the excessive use of force should also be one where the council may take action with the first offense. Um, Selena has a hand up. I think I raised my hand way back when we were talking about section G and uh, uh, future section H. And I was going to ask if because, but I actually agree with what Martin just said. I think it would make sense to encompass excessive use of force in, um, in the provisions that the council may be, especially because it it's a may and not a shall may take action for on a first offense. I would, I would agree wholeheartedly with what Martin just said. And I think what I had been planning to ask about the, if we um, added um, a separate section for H, so we added the inter back to the intervening and reporting, aren't we sort of functionally making that an and then because of how that um section is constructed because it, it's it's been moved from like a such as to a shell include so i'm not sure it doesn't create like more discretion on that necessarily i don't think in my reading i'm missing something that is that is how I interpret it. I interpret if you create two separate sub subdivisions here, or if you just use the word and, I think it would have the same practical effect. So would you, you take the or out of F and put a, put a semicolon, is that? It would, it's in G, so it would be failing to intervene and report to a supervisor when the officer observes another officer placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. Later. <laughs> what's your- Thanks. What's your preference committee? committee? Well, I, I had my hand up. It was going to be the same exact thing that Selena just brought up. I mean, uh, by adding a G, we're uh, in uh, Bryn kind of verified it. We're essentially just putting in an and in the place of or. And from what I've heard, it, it's in, to intervene and report is uh, is just going above and beyond what I believe will happen. It, uh, again, the, the, the officer that's fresh out of uh, uh, the academy is not going to intervene and report. Um, uh, I believe that there's a, a much better chance they're going to they're going to do uh, they're going to do the report, and if they do intervene, a report is going to be done anyway. Um, I I mean I'm. Um, I'm dug in on, on the way it's written, written now, the failing to intervene or report. I, I, um, from everything that I've heard, I, I think it, um, I mean, maybe it's not perfect, but it, uh, I, I think it covers a little bit of everything that, that, that people want um, overall. So. Martin. Well, I, I want that junior officer to intervene. And I want there to be consequences if he doesn't interview. I don't care if it's the captain of, or the chief. If, if we've seen the, this occur, then, then there should be an intervention. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I think it should be pretty made very clear that if there's an opportunity to intervene, the person should intervene. Uh, and there's separately, if they've observed this, whether they've intervened or not, 
they should have to report. Well, I, I think it's easier said than done on an intervention in those situations. Well, I'm sure it is. And, and maybe if Nader can, you know, I see Nader has his hand up. So yeah. Go ahead, Nader. If you want, uh, Martin, if you want to see that happen, it starts primarily with changing the entire culture of how policing actually works because it's as as tom said it is much easier said than done but the the paramilitary mentality is very strong in respecting rank structure and i mean in some police departments more so than others uh, in the state police it was very strong and you know changing that is what needs to be changed if you want to see that sort of intervention of a person fresh out of the academy telling a 15-year sergeant to stop using force. Well, I mean, I will comment that three officers that watched uh, the officer in Minneapolis uh, without intervening were junior officers. Uh, <laughs> um, but still, I, I don't see how not having this as a consequence uh, and perhaps through the whole process when there's an investigation and such, does that come up as part of the investigation? Does that matter as what kind of discipline would be meted out uh, by, for, for that situation that you've talked about? Uh, I mean, is that where that's captured, that, that problem? Uh, but I still think that there has to be some consequence and, and and putting this in there is one step perhaps towards changing what, what maybe they're not changing the culture, but you're certainly saying that there's consequences for the way that culture is working. And I do understand, Tom, from what you're saying, it's easier said than done, but that doesn't mean that we should uh, let somebody off the hook uh, and make them explain themselves and why they didn't intervene. If I don't they think that they would be off the hook because they're still required to report what happened? Well, they may be required to report, but you may have a cadaver on the ground. So true. And that's, that's, that's why we've been debating this for so long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob Hooper. <clears throat> Sorry, I said that was going to be my last word and it isn't because you just brought up the crux of the issue. This is what we want to change. This is our goal. This is what we start in the academy and we move up through the ranks. Um, if we don't start the institutional change of the reaction here, then it isn't gonna change in the field. Uh, that's sort of why I considered this to be worth the argument. Tom Burdett. Yeah, so I, I think a question for Nader, not uh, situation Nader, uh, uh, somebody's on the ground wrestling with somebody, the, uh, the proverbial rookie shows up, um, intervenes, uh, body cams are on everywhere, and it's determined that uh, what was happening um, wasn't against any policy, that everything was, you know, was above board. Uh, what happens from that point to the person who intervenes in a situation that didn't uh, warrant an intervention? And maybe even the guy gets the person gets away or whatever. The um, that person who intervened would probably. I mean, it depends more. Depends on the circumstances, really. But I mean, that person could get in trouble, um, especially if the person gets away. Um, it. it it wouldn't be looked favorably upon. Uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't be looked favorably upon. I can see something like that ruining somebody's career in the state police. <laughs> Jim Harrison. Okay, I at the risk of belaboring this, um, I um, I think we all agree that we would want the officers and the junior officers in Minneapolis to have intervened. Um, I don't know the right way to do that. Um, my only concern with the wording was Natter's um, 
situation of coming onto the scene, you were back up or whatever, you pulled in and you didn't know what was going on. And now we say you have a responsibility to intervene when you don't know the situation. Um, I would be interested in reaching out to either the commissioner or the um, Troopers Association um, to Mike to see if they have any suggestions on wording or whether they can live with the um, intervene and report whether that raises any red flags for them. That's all. Um, and I, I was only kidding. I am available tomorrow morning. So um, <laughs> if, um, if, if I, I just want to do this right. Um, so I think we all do. Thank you. So let's flag this and see if we can wrap, uh, wrap up closure on some of the other sections of the bill. Um, and we can circle back to this after we have done um, the rest of the walkthrough. So am I also flagging for follow-up that limitation on council sanctions, whether or not other category B conduct, including sexual harassment and uh, biased enforcement and excessive use of force is sanctionable on a first offense? Am I following up with that later or are we putting that in the next draft? So I, my suggestion was at least just the excessive use of force. I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't suggesting the other category B. Okay, so not, not sexual harassment involving physical uh, contact. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing seems a little odd. I would reject the whole thing and let, let the council uh, that they may look at any of these things, but that might be a step too far from what where we are right now. So, but excessive use of force seems very much in line with what we have in F and G right now. Yeah, and I feel like um, I feel like this is for sure going to be an area that we take a closer look at when we look at the um, the aspects of 124 that are coming over. It doesn't sound like this is covered in 124 as I had thought though, uh, Sarah, maybe. Well, that doesn't mean we can't. That's a nice point, nice point. Launch into it. <laughs> but are you saying that, is, are you okay with doing the excessive force at least in here or just keep it as it is right now? Um, I don't have an objection to making the change that you have suggested, but um, I'm one of many committee members on this. Selena, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I, I agree with I agree with that. Um, I agree with that suggestion. Just the excessive use of force and and look at the other um, categories later. But this is really all of a. Uh, I mean, it really is all the behavior that we're we're really trying to get at in this bill. And I don't think it makes sense to to leave that out from this exception. Uh, Maxine. Yeah, and then my understanding is if we did that, we would keep the may as opposed to changes to shall. I, th I think I heard Selena say that earlier, right? Um, well, I, I get, yeah, I guess I understood that the may was there. And you're right, we haven't had that whole conversation. But um, I think if the may is there, it's definitely an argument for um, creating more, more options for the council, not less. Yeah, yeah. Bryn, does that make sense? Okay. Yep. All right, we're flagging that G and we'll come back to it and let's see if we can take off the remaining sections of the bill. Okay, so we've moved down to section five, the crime. So we have this uh, taken out of this draft. And if you'll recall, there's that language in the legislative intent section um, that states that the 
um, committees of jurisdiction will will consider whether um, there needs to be a new crime um, that would impose crim criminal penalties for a law enforcement officer who um, puts a person in a prohibited restraint that causes serious bodily injury or death. That's on page three, subsection three. Uh, Maxine's got her hand up. Thank you. So I want to bring us back to represent, uh, Representative Ann Donahue's uh, testimony uh, where she says that um, if we include the new criminal section included now, there should be a report back in August to allow for potential needed revisions and the effective date should not occur until January to allow for education and training. I think that went more to the excessive force, but I, um, so, so one possibility, because I also heard very clearly from folks that they did want to include a new crime, because that's really what, what we're here for. So one possibility would be if we do keep it in there, and then with, um, with Representative Donahue's suggestion, um, we could have, um, for instance, the, because we heard from uh, state's attorneys from James Pepper that the state's attorneys are looking into this, so we could have a group of, um, you know, state's attorneys, Defender General's Office, um, Human Rights Commission, I don't know, we can name them, but that they could report back to us um, when we come back in August. And so that, anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Selena? Um, I had a question for Bryn, but don't wanna preclude people from responding to Maxine. Okay. Um, it, it is about the section though. Uh, maybe I'll just ask and it can be part of the whole conversation. I, Bryn, I'm, um, I am wondering if you um, agree with the commissioner's view that if we weren't to create a new crime here, um, it would be possible for um, an officer to be charged under existing law in uh, what I understand to be Title 13, 1024, aggravated assault. And if you, I'm just trying to understand like how high of a bar that is to meet then. So um, I think that it's, it depends on the circumstances. I don't disagree that under a particular set of circumstances, a law enforcement officer may be charged with aggravated assault. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony earlier, there's, there's not a perfect alignment between the new crime and the aggravated assault statute. Um, I think arguably it may be um, easier for a law enforcement officer to be prosecuted for placing a person in a prohibited restraint under the new crime um, because it specifically prohibits the use of these kinds of restraints for law enforcement. And it also, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't contain a cont an intent element. So um, essentially, if a law enforcement officer does um, undertake this conduct, put a person in a prohibited restraint, and the restraint causes the person to experience serious bodily injury or death, then um, the officer would be culpable regardless of their intent or mental state. But again, that is, um, that's only if there's, if, if the um, defense does not raise the, a self-defense um, defense. Yeah. And, um, or if they do raise it and the prosecution can still uh, prove that the, that the officer was not acting in self-defense. And um, the other portion of this is that nothing about this new crime uh, changes or alters the, um, the justifiable homicide statute, which I know you haven't gotten into in any depth, but justifiable homicide is a statute that provides that um, 
a person shall not be guilty for wounding or killing another person if that wounding or killing is done in the person's own self-defense or the defense of the person's various family members um, or if it's done in preventing essentially a violent felony. So, um, and then there's another portion of that, of the of the justifiable homicide statute that provides that a law enforcement officer um, can wound or kill another person in carrying out the law enforcement officer's duties. Um, so, so I would just, I would point out that those defenses are available, um, even, even if the new crime, um, where to where to be there, and the and the language, um, the language affirming in the section that's now in, that's been removed in this draft, the language affirming the justifiable homicide defense is really just a recognition of current law, right? Right. It was initially incorporated by reference. Um, in the in in one version of the Senate's S219, but then by floor amendment they removed that incorporation by reference because that particular portion of the justifiable homicide statute, it's subdivision three of 13 BSA 2305, um, sort of stands um, sort of diametrically opposed to the provisions of the new crime. Um, and if you and if you look at the wording of it, you can see why. So there, there is a concern that um, by enacting the new crime, that particular subdivision of the justifiable homicide statute, there may be um, an, an implied repeal argument that could be made um, if somebody were to, if a law enforcement officer were to try and use that particular subdivision as a defense to the new crime. Does that, does that make sense? I know we haven't gotten into that statute a lot, so it may be unclear for, for some members of the committee. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you'd like, but I don't wanna take you down a path that the commit that you don't wanna go. Okay. Um, Maxine. Yeah, I think though, Brynn, that's, that's pretty, that's significant though. <laughs> I mean, the whole potential repeal and I, and, you know, statutory construction. I think that's right. That's the yes, and that, that's why the um, the Senate Judiciary Committee had made a commitment to work on um, the justifiable homicide statute. I think that they felt comfortable at that point um, moving the bill with the new crime because they heard testimony from several witnesses saying that the defenses of self-defense were still available and the defense under the justifiable homicide statute was still available there was a question about whether that particular subdivision under justifiable homicide would still be available or if that would be subject to an implied repeal argument. But um, they, they went ahead and voted out the bill with that with the new crime in it and the commitment to working on the justifiable homicide statute either in August, um, either in, in the remaining time that they had this session or in August. Tom Burnett. Thank you. Bryn, did you say uh, if, if we put the new crime in there, it makes it easier to charge? Is that what I heard? I think that there, there is an argument that you could make that um, because the uh, aggravated assault statute contains an intent element and this new crime doesn't contain an, an intent element, that it may be easier um, for a prosecutor to prove each element um, of the offense. But again, it, de it de depends on the circumstances of the situation. Um, I guess with an aggravated assault and, and, and intent, I mean, that, that covers everybody right now. And I, I gotta believe when that law was written, there was a reason to put that intent in there. And, um, and I, I just have an issue with any demographic, if we're gonna single out any demographic and, and uh, for whatever reason to, uh, to make it easier to charge them uh, for uh, basically the same crime. I would just note that the aggravated assault statute does have a provision that makes it easier to charge someone who's assaulting a police who is assaulting a police officer so aggravated assault actually uh, 
it encapsulates your concern in reverse, as I think, as I understand it. But. Yeah, I appreciate that, but I still don't look at it as a balance, I guess. I'm just looking at the one new law that we're we're looking at and uh, and I know in the past that we've uh, we've really shied away from from new laws as much as possible. So anyway, I would have I would have a, a problem with creating a new law around this and making it easier to charge anybody. It doesn't matter the the demographic and uh, I certainly didn't hear the argument over you know around why police officers it, um, it's easier to be charged, you know, for assault of the police officers. And... Uh, Jim Harrison. Um, I would uh, support I, what I think I heard for Maxine's recommendation to ask the state's attorneys uh, to come back um, they're the ones that have to prosecute these cases. Um, I would, and it sounded like they had some issues with it as it was came over from the Senate uh, and would have some suggestions, uh, but they needed to a little time to work that out. So if you, you know, I would support putting something in here to uh, ask them and or other stakeholders to come back with recommendations that we can insert in August. So if I, yeah, if I could just clarify, I was um, I was reading from Ann Donahue's testimony, and uh, my understanding of the testimony was that if we leave the crime in uh, to make the effective date later, and then um, have have a group report uh, back to us when we come back, so that if we so the thinking is that we could do the revisions, we could hear from the state's attorneys and others in terms of where they've gotten and make the revisions before this new, if needed, before this new crime goes into effect, whether it's, you know, October or something, I, I forget what she said, or January, um, but that it's, that's when it, it, you know, if we decide to put it in there. So I just wanted to make sure that that was, that that was clear. Um, and I, I, I see that actually as a, as a good compromise because I think there, from testimony, I think there are a number of people that want us to, have a new crime in there. People also want us to get it right uh, and realize, you know, that we can't get it right now. But but by having it in there, pushed out effective date with a group of, um, like I, you know, Defender General, State's Attorneys, Human Rights Commission um, coming back and they can work on it, you know, before we get back in August. Um, I think I think that's a good compromise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, that's a fair point, Maxine. I guess I'm a little apprehensive if the different stakeholders can't agree or we can't agree with the recommendations um, that we end up with something in statute that may cause problems that, um, so I, uh, I, I don't know, I'm just, and this would be for Bryn, but is there a way we could put it in, but um, not have it take effect until the legislature signs off? I mean, it's sort of like a two vote process. <laughs> I don't know, um, you know, by a date certain by September 30th or something. Um, I don't know. Um, I just, uh, uh, well, you know, we got to get this done, and then this is, you know, um, I understand it's an important part to, you know, many. Uh, so um, I just, I don't want to make it, I don't want to do something we regret later. Um, that's all. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, Brian, if it's in, uh, prosecutors have complete and total discretion over what they charge under, right? Yes. So. Yes, they do. So they could charge under either one, their choice. Yes. <clears throat> and as for Representative Harrison's question, um, I think it, it may be a little bit tricky to uh, require that 
there be, um, I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to hinge it on some criteria for the legislature to, to, to take another action. I'm not sure you could hinge the um, effective date on, on a report um, unless the legislature took some additional action. Um, but okay, um, is there any issue if we put this in, convene a task force to come back with recommendations and we um, change it? Are we undoing something that we just passed? What, what if we decided the stakeholder said, look, this is not workable at all, take it out. Yeah, so we, we do that all the time, revise, um, revise laws that haven't yet gone into effect. Um, and an example of that is the Justice Reinvestment Act actually um, requires it enacts some, some legislation um, at, a, at an advanced date and requires a report back prior to that date with the understanding that if there are issues raised by the stakeholders that the legislature will fix that piece of legislation that is not going into effect until later on. So that's something that you do some routinely. Okay, I'm just aware, aware of the house rules that um, we can't negate something that, or whatever that redact something, so thank you. Tom Burdett. Yeah, um, around the same issue, if we put the, the new crime in there, uh, uh, could we sunset it? Uh, that way it has to get worked on. Um, and if the stakeholders uh, don't come to an agreement, it, it goes away. If that's a question for me, that I... That, that's a question for whoever wants to... Pipe in. <laughs> um, Maxine. Yeah, actually, I had thought of that too, Tom. Um, I guess our committee is just so familiar with sunsets, right? Um, but no, I did, but really, I did think about it. And, but Bryn, can you, so in terms of um, what we did in justice reinvestment, in terms of revisiting something, how does that differ from binding a future legislature? Or, or, would we, we'd be binding ourselves in the in August? Is that what or? I don't think that you are binding yourselves with that requirement because um, you're you're bumping out the effective date to essentially give the next uh, legislature an opportunity to work on something before it takes effect. Um, so so, that, so it's not binding. It's not. We're not telling them. We're just. It's be, it's just the. Okay. Yes, yeah. the, idea, the idea is that it creates more of an incentive for the legislature to work on something if it actually takes effect um, at a date certain. Does that make sense? Like rather than, rather than not enacting it and putting a report in and having the report come to the legislature and then expecting the legislature to take up that report and deal with it, if you're actually enacting the law at a, at a date certain, then you sort of have to, you have to address that whatever the report is um, prior to the effective date. So I think it's just a way of, of it's, your own, it's your own stick that you're imposing on yourselves, I think. Yeah. So what's the wisdom of the collective? Do we want to, uh, do we want to obligate ourselves to do this work by extending the effective date and coming back to this? Martin? Well, I, I would rather be a sunset because it forces us to. Just an extended date doesn't necessarily force us to do it if we happen to get too busy on something else. Um, it could happen. So I would agree with the extended date uh, plus the sunset. If that brings, if that brings along Tom on all this, and <laughs> and we keep Will in here, who made it pretty clear that he wouldn't like this if we did not have the crime, then then I'm fine with. That. I prefer to to drop the crime and get it right beforehand, but I would go along with that other plan. Right. So so both, right? So, yeah, I think yeah. both would, would, yeah. would assure that we we do deal with it because just because we right. have an effective day at the end of the year, that does not mean that we will. But so um, I don't disagree with it. Um, I, I just don't know what it would accomplish by having both. 
and not just the sunset. I don't, I don't see the difference. I would want to have uh, August to try to get it right. Yep. So I would not want this to go into effect until sometime after the end of the session to actually, because I, I do see some big issues with it. And I have had a uh, communication with a little bit more with, uh, with uh, Pepper. And I think there's a much better way to address this. And I do think that the justifiable homicide statute needs to be de uh, dealt with before this goes into in, uh, effect. So I really think we need to, I mean, I'm more set on having the effective date towards the end of the year. I'm, I'm throwing the sunset your way to make you feel more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, no, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with both. I just didn't see uh, what, what the difference would make, but, but yeah, I, I'm all over that. <laughs> Selena? Yeah, I was just gonna add to a little bit to what Martin said, and I, I do think it's, important to take time to get this section right. I'm, I'm, I'm um, still pondering the mechanics of these various proposals about how to do that. But I'll note that, I mean, I know state's attorneys have issues with this. I also think there's some advocates who really have issues with what the Senate did here. And I don't know if people saw it, but there was a, a op-ed about this by um, Wilda White in Digger, I think today, and that, that had a lot of critiques of the section and some of which I thought were compelling. Um, so uh, about some of the implications of um, creating the new crime and offering and, and then preserving the defenses that were preserved. And so I think there's a lot to consider on all sides about how to get this right, I guess is, is uh, I just wanted to note that. That's so, a good point. Go ahead, Max. Yeah, so Selena, so building on that, what, um, so the mechanics of it, I mean, I guess I see if we have an effective date, again, Ann Donahue said Jan January, but, and Martin, I'm not sure what effective date you were thinking of, but um, if we had an effective date, let's say, I don't know, October or January, or something like that, um, and then the sunset would be a year after maybe, because um, we know we're not good with two years. Um, and then I, in terms of the, the group, um, the stakeholders, I don't think we need to create a, a commission or anything like that. I think it's, um, you know, building on what we know that the state's attorneys are doing, but certainly need to have the Defender General's office. And so that's, that's the, but anyway, some sort of work group. So, so the two dates wouldn't be pretty close to the same time. That that wouldn't make sense because if by by whether it's October or January first, if the or whenever we take it up, if the stakeholders don't agree to it, um, you know, can't come to a uh, consensus on what the language is or what the law does. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense for it to sunset sooner than later? I don't totally understand why we need a sunset if we have a pushed back effective date that then, and we're waiting for, um, we're waiting to quote unquote get it right. Uh, I mean, is that just like extra insurance? I think it might, that might send a weird message about our commitment to this. I'm trying to I, I look at it as a commitment to this because it, it forces us to work on it. Uh, um, again, there's, there's probably won't happen, but there's always that chance that we could get busy on something else and it, and it doesn't get done. I mean, there's, there is that potential. And with a sunset, it gets done. Okay. And what, whatever the date is, I guess. I'm, I'm not going to argue so too let's, much. Let's ask the question. Um, are folks comfortable with the, the sunset and the extended uh, effective date concept? 
Nobody's diving in and nobody's saying no. I don't see any tears. Uh, Mike Merwicki. I was agreeing with you. That's why okay. I raised my hand. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, then I guess the next question is, what's the date that we should be looking at? How much time will this process take to, as we've said, get it right? Well, uh, the date. I just, I, I'm sorry. I, I just had a proposal and it was on mute of October 1st for the uh, for it to kick in and July 1st, 2021 for the sunset. For purposes of discussion. So your effective date of October 1st, 2020 would um, would really hold hold your feet to the fire as a judiciary committee to, to get this done during our August, September timeframe before was, it becomes effective? Yeah, I was going to ask that as far as time frame goes. I mean, I, it's not the kind of thing that I think it, once we pass, it, it, it could go into a, well, I mean, if we fix it, it, it should go into a effect right away. And I don't know what January buys us if we're, I'm just hoping we're done by October 1st. If we're not going to be done by October 1st, maybe we should push it off until January. Jim Harrison. I'm good with Martin's suggestion. I just want to move on. <laughs> <laughs> we're wearing you down, Jim. <laughs> Ice well, cream. you know, I didn't exactly get a lunch break and now, I'm, now supper break is... Uh, uh, looming. <laughs> yes. I, so chair, I, chair, can we see what other kind of concessions we can get out of Jim uh, now <laughs> while he's hungry and tired? If he brings donuts, he has to deliver. The The only problem I'd have with a, with a July 1st date or a sunset being that far out, if the stakeholders can't come to an agreement, we've got uh, a law in effect for eight months that nobody wants. Not, not nobody, but you know what I mean, that there, there isn't an agreement on. Well. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a law that nobody wants. Um, right. And certainly it's a law that some people might have some dissatisfaction with. And, you know, I, I, I share hesitation because I, you know, I'm, I'm not sold at all that we need a sunset. And, but I would, I would go along with it to, to advance this. And again, we have to think about the fact that, you know, there are people throughout the state who, who have met, who have protested, who continue to say, um, this needs to be done. And, you know, what the people sitting around these, you know, so-called invisible tables right now and, you know, on Zoom, what we all know it, about sunset dates and what that will, you know, encourage us to do, the, how to make work get done, that is not something that necessarily translates to, you know, the average prudent citizen. I mean, they're looking at it quite possibly and saying they are so uh, disconnected from this, they are so unsold on the need for this that they've got a sunset um, that's almost immediately following the passage of the law. What kind of crock is this? So if we do have to have a sunset, if that's what we need to move this forward, you know, I, I think there needs to be some sort of gap to show people and to help us explain to people, well, we need some time to, to work on this. We need some time to perfect it. And I think having a, a passage date and a sunset date that are slammed up against each other will really send the wrong message to a lot of Vermonters. Yeah, I'm not gonna argue against if they're, you know, if they're separated, but um, I, I did wanna say that your constituents are much more educated than mine are to, to understand all that. But. <laughs> So, Will, are you okay with the July 1st, or did you have a different suggestion? No, I'm okay with that, but I certainly wouldn't want to see it any sooner than that. I mean, that's that's got to be the, the the earliest possible date that we uh, that we shove in here. All right, Barbara. So, I'm I think it's framing the issue as there's a sunset date in here, and that's to recognize that this may very well not be perfect. And as we're gathering more information in the, in the next year, we're committed to 
making sure this is the right um, legislation. It's our best thinking, but we're committing ourselves to revisiting it. Okay, Maxine, support that. Right, so I think um, for discussion purposes, let's say um, October 1 effective date, July sunset, go back to our, um, our intent and see if, we, um, if we've made that commitment um, or if it's clear enough in terms of what, to capture what Barbara just said. Folks okay doing that? I'm seeing some nodding, good. All right, let's do that. So just, uh, just in terms of um, collective expectations here, what I'm, what I'm assuming we are aiming to do is to get through the, um, this uh, run through of the bill, which we are almost done doing. Um, I have invited Mike O'Neill to come and have a conversation with us for a few moments about that previous section that we were uh, hung up on. And then our hope would be to take a, a short break if Bryn needs to go redraft something and then that we would come back and, um, and take official action on this as soon as we can see a clean draft which means that we are on eight hours and 18 minutes already today. So let's, uh, let's see if we can crank through the remaining decision points. Can I just get some clarification on the last one? Yes. So you want the new crime to take effect on October 1st and you want it to be sunsetted, repealed on July 1st of next year. Do you also want the justifiable homicide statute subdivision three to be repealed on July 1st to um, ins ensure that the work is also done on that statute or are you going to leave that one alone? That's the one that provides that a person who wounds or kills another person in a law enforcement officer in suppressing opposition against him or her um, is guiltless. That's, I, the, I don't know if the committee has taken a good look at that subdivision, um, but I can read it to you if you want. Yes, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so it provides that if a person kills or wounds another under any of the following circumstances, he or she shall be guiltless. Subdivision three provides in the case of a civil officer or a military officer or a private soldier when lawfully called out to suppress riot or rebellion, or to prevent or suppress invasion, or to assist in serving legal process in suppressing opposition against him or her in the just and necessary discharge of his or her duty. So that, I think that's, that may give you the committees a better idea of why this came up in context of this new crime. Um, so, it may be your desire to also sunset that provision to ensure that um, that statute is also dealt with. Martin. Bryn, I, I think what they, page are you on? Uh, that is not in the bill. That's, um, that is a, another law called the Justifiable Homicide Statute. It's at 13 VSA 2305, subdivision three. So, I think that's a brilliant idea, I, 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 and and um, because that that's my biggest concern, one of my biggest concerns about this this law, but actually that that's the law we should frankly have been de dealing with all along because essentially, you know, the situation where the uh, law enforcement's called out to suppress a riot. How do you exactly define the riot? Uh, we've supposedly seen a lot of those around the country that they would be able to use lethal force and and get away with it essentially or serving legal process that, that they would be able to get away with uh, excessive force or, or lethal force. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it, it's pretty archaic, uh, even though it was passed in 1983, but that was back in different days. So I think that, that this one has to be dealt with at the same time as we're dealing with the other uh, new crime. So I, I support that. Maxine? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Bryn, for, for catching that. And, and I do know that the Senate Judiciary Committee is, is committed um, to this. It also helps to, to put that in there, to put the sunset in there to, to make sure that, that we do that. And it, and it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Um, I think it could be confusing if we didn't do that. So thank you, Bryn, for, for catching that. Um, and so that would bring us back to, uh, let's see, page three of the intent, uh, line seven, subdivision three, and whether whether or not we would need to change this or whether or not it's still okay, I'm not sure, but maybe folks can get there and Brian certainly you can chime in. Yep, so I think that that would need to be changed. I put that in sort of in, uh, in connection with the removal of the new crime, but I think if you're leaving it in with the delayed effective date and the repeal that you, we could all, I can create some language that says that the committees of jurisdiction will review that section of law in connection with um, 13 BSA 2305, the justifiable homicide statute and the other statute that's referenced there um, with respect to the duty of a sheriff. Um, and we can put in some language about who the standing committees should be working with if, if that's what you'd like, the state's attorneys and the defender general and others, if that's appropriate. Yeah, and I think that's great. So I think the standing uh, committees would be certainly these two committees in the House and Senate. Right, or does how the Senate, does Senate Judiciary do? Yes, so the Senate Judiciary did 219. As you can see, it's a similar overlap in the Senate for the, these particular issues. Right, but the, what about government operations in Senate? Would they be, do we have yes. both? Yeah, okay. I think they would be involved in, um, particularly in 24 BSA 299. Right, okay. So yeah, I think those standing committees. Yeah, Selena, yeah. Um, Maxine, I liked your earlier um, suggestion that in addition to um, some of our frequent flyers in the court system, the state's attorneys and defender general, that we would also seek input from the Human Rights Commission on. Mm -hmm. So, Martin? yeah, the um, going back to just I, I'm seeing when we just went back to that in, intense uh, section that uh, I had earlier suggested and paragraph six that we make sure we have it broader than just the uh, listed uh, entities, the civil liberties union, racial disparities and criminal ju and juvenile justice system advisory board, et cetera, to have that broader that we can bring in other interests. And I think we should do the same for the one that we're talking about right now, uh, have, not have it limited because we should have it broader because I know there are other groups that want to weigh in. Agree, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Great. Great. So, Bryn, does that give you um, a sense of which direction to go? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, that's good. I think um, I think I've got I've got some good direction and I've got some notes for um, for where I need to incorporate some some things that have been suggested. Um, when, when is the committee planning on reconvening or are you going to stay convened while I go and do this? Um, it depends on how much time you need. I mean, we do, we do have one other, uh, conversation that we want to have, um, with respect to the language on page nine, um, which we can have while you're off camera and, and hopefully at that point we will have some clarity on what direction we want to move forward. Okay. All right. Then I'll, I'll sign off for now and, and uh, email the chairs when I've got a new draft. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. Okay. So um, if the committee committees would um, take a peek at page nine, and I'd like to invite Mike O'Neill to join us. Um, we have been going around on on subsection G, failing to intervene or report to a supervisor when the officer observes another officer placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. Um, 
would love to hear your initial reactions to that. And then I would also invite committee members who have um, who have specific questions um, to raise their hand and, and be ready to ask Mike some questions. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to weigh in again on this. And I've sat and had some time to think about both of these. And it clearly is a big difference in whether you are going to be asked to intervene and notify your supervisor or do one or the other. And I believe every policy is going to be changed if they haven't already and probably require both, or I think they should require both that you intervene and notify a supervisor. I would assume that this is gonna be an area that is heavily trained and it's gonna be made clear what the expectation is if you observe this conduct. And I don't think I could possibly support something that didn't require you to do both. I think it makes sense that you would have to intervene and that you would have to also notify a supervisor. Um, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I, the, the reason it was put or was, um, I think, at the suggestion of Nader, uh, in that if you were arriving at a scene, or this was the example, if you were arriving at a scene and you didn't know all the details, do you have a responsibility to jump to a conclusion and intervene? And that's why the or was added um, and also to get at the issue if you looked at a video later, even if you weren't there, you would have a re ob obligation to report. So, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we may be fine with putting in, we just wanna make sure we're not uh, doing something that caused issue for an officer arriving on this scene or some other situation that we're not thinking of. Yes, I understand that. And I did think about that. And I'm looking at this from the perspective of someone who does defend police officers when they face discipline. And the standard they are always judged on is what facts they knew at the time and what action can you take based on the facts that are known. And I think it would be very easy in a defense to explain this is what I knew at that moment. Um, and I think that would be a reasonable argument to make that at that moment, I did not have facts to lead me to believe that there was anything improper yet. But it, it is a good question that is being raised. Um, but I still am assuming that policies will require both. You know, if you have knowledge at the time that something is improper, you must act. You know, if you don't yet have that knowledge, I, I don't think you know, you'll be facing an action against you. you know, it depends on what you knew at the time, just like any crime. Um, as a union representative, I'd like to argue the other side of this, I think, but it doesn't, I think, make sense to take that duty away from somebody if that's the responsibility we're trying to put on them. Good. Thanks, Mike. I'm good. Maxine? So thank you, Mike. That's that's really helpful. And in terms of the effective date, um, you said that you think policies are going to be um, changed and people will be trained to that. Um, is that is that something that's happening now? Do we need to give? Because I, I think this effective goes uh, in effect on passage. So I'm not sure if we need to to give a little bit more time for that um, instead of a non passage. Pump passage, something a little longer? Um, I can't speak for every department in Vermont. Some of them may take a little longer to get this into their policies. The state police are going to be doing this immediately. Um, in fact, I think the policies already reflect it. Um, but some time may not be bad to ensure that every department has this done before the law goes into effect. Yeah, the effective date's on passage. Um, Tom? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, to, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't see that coming the, with the and or the or. And, uh, and from what you said, it, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's a written policy or not, but it sounds like you're uh, um, 
that it's done, that those types of things are done anyway. And, and I'm really pleasantly surprised or pleasantly pleased, I guess, or, or uh, mildly pleased that, that it is an and uh, because it does certainly cover uh, more territory. But um, one of the concerns I, that I had that I brought up is a situation uh, that was already brought up if somebody came up on the scene and you know it was uh you know somebody that was fresh out of the academy you know uh, intervening on somebody you know with 15 years on the on the police force and and i guess i'd, I'd like to hear your your thoughts on that as far as uh the potential of somebody uh not intervening or um you, you did answer one of my questions because it's it's a lot of it is judged by what you believe is happening at the time but um, but yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to know uh, your perspective on the on the pecking order. I guess you could say, uh, as far as um, you know, rank goes. Um, that can be a difficult issue, and I'd prefer not to get deep into this discussion. But I think this is what occurred in Minneapolis. Um, there were some very new officers there, and that is an issue. And it's why I feel that this is going to become a big part of training. Um, the initial training is going to have to cover this and make it clear that, you know, the pecking order per se is something that has to be ignored when we're in these situations. But it is going to be a difficult and sticky issue for some brand new police officers. I hope we don't find ourselves in that situation. But I do believe it's based on, it, you'll be judged based on the knowledge you had of the situation at the time. Right. Great. And I appreciate your testimony on this. I mean, it seems like, a, I mean, to look at it, you know, whether you're saying and or or, I guess to the layperson, it, it may look like something small, but it's uh, was very, it, it's very big to the two committees. And, and we certainly had a lot of discussion around it. And uh, I, I think you've, you've put the discussion to rest. I agree. It, it, I think it is very significant, the difference between the two, um, a much different obligation to do one or the other rather than both. Thank you. Martin. Thank you. Just a very technical question then, given this conversation, and this isn't really a question necessary for you, Mike, but you can weigh in <clears throat> on whether it would be clear for law enforcement if we just change in this letter G, the or to an and, or whether we have a separate G that deals with the intervening and an H that deals with the reporting. Uh, I don't think I have a preference on that. So I guess I don't have an answer. And let's do and. <laughs> yeah, change the order to and. It's easy. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's I simpler. Agree. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So if we could feel certain that we, um, that we want to give legislative council some direction on that, I would ask us to also make a decision now about um, bumping out that effective date so that we can let Bryn know that the draft that she's bringing back to us anytime now should uh, include those changes. So what do folks think about an effective date on that section? How much time is enough time for uh, to be ready? You're talking about the and or that we we're just looking at. Well, the whole the whole section, the, I, the, the whole, whole section. provision. Right, right, yeah. So, what would that have an effect on uh, the academy or continuing education? I vote for December first. <laughs> That's generous. I know. <laughs> November first. I was just trying to think how much time. I was going to say October, but I like October. I, I thought I was going to be yeah. I'd support October, but no later than I mean no late, not any further back than December. I guess I would ask Michael uh, if he's still on. Uh, would that create an issue getting the word out to? Uh, uh, the state police and, and all the different uh, departments around the state? Uh, I don't believe it would. I think this is an issue that you know, the word's going to get out very quickly on. The administrators are going to have to act very quickly on it. Uh, I'd prefer to see some time, but it's an issue we will be able to address. Okay, great. Or, or, or they will be able to address, I should say. I, I don't run a department. 
Right, right. Elena? Yes, I, I am not totally sold or convinced that we need to extend the effective date for this section. So it just, I may, be the, I may be the total outlier on that, but. What was the effective date, October 1st? From passage right now, right? Oh, from passage. I think that's what it is now, yeah. Well, often, often when we're not still here, if we don't do um, upon passage, it's often July 1 or September 1st. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we could keep it consistent with the other one that was October 1st. Um, and, the, and it sounds like people are going to be already reacting to this immediately. Uh, so this, but this gives them until October 1st. And once that happens, they have to have it done. Yeah, I, to me, on passage, I mean, in a perfect world, yeah, on passage. But uh, I think the word does need to get out, you know, at least, you know, to me, a minimum, at least giving a month um, for preparation or for some training or whatever. So then we could do September. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine with me. I support <laughs> September 1? Yeah. <laughs> fine with me. Yeah, I mean, that, that's two months, right? July and August. And um, the next level three basic training starts August 31st. Oh. So when they get to their second day of training, if this is a September one, uh, it will be enacted. Uh, Kelly. I, yeah, I would certainly defer to Mike to make sure that all the training, if, if this sense is other police departments, not just the Vermont State Police, are going to be able to get the training in. I think everybody's pretty aware uh, what's needing to be done. Um, and again, I, we didn't go back to finding out if people are going to have trouble making sure they have the um, equipment readily available. I mean, is there any concern around that? And to get the, I mean, not to say anybody's allowed to vacation between now and September 1st, but if they were, then you have to make sure you're getting all your um, your folks in for training. Good point, Martin. So, so I would really on um, this one would like to defer to what Gov, GovOps thinks is an appropriate time frame, since you guys deal with the training much more than we ever do in judiciary. Well, and this is as much about training uh, existing officers as it is about uh, incorporating this into the training of new officers. And so um, if it were only about training new officers, I would say effective immediately is the way to go. Um, although if the next class doesn't start until August 31st, it would be sort of arbitrary. But, you know, the, the conversation around how you how you train existing agencies um, is is kind of the uh, the issue that's at hand here, and I guess giving them at least a month to figure out how they communicate this and uh, and implement this within their agencies makes sense. So you're good with September first. I am. Anybody? Mike, I was going to ask if, if Mike thought September 1st was uh, giving is two months enough notice to uh, to get just to get the word out. Uh, I think I would want to be careful not to speak for agency heads. Um, yeah, I run one of the unions. I don't want to speak for a department head, a, a police chief. <laughs> I guess I can understand that. <laughs> Uh, Bob Hooper. Uh, Mike, this is this is more like a directive than it is training. Would you not characterize it that way? I mean, it's this is a new way you do policing, but it's kind of straightforward. I would, 
I would agree. Um, I, I, it is clearly very straightforward, but it also needs to become part of the use of force yeah. training so that it's very clear when you're in these situations, the expectation of you. Yeah, I agree with that. It's not like a, you're not going to drag everybody back to the academy for two weeks. No. Thank you. So September 1. Anybody objecting to September 1? I think September 1 it is. And um, and um, yeah, and I, I have emailed Bryn about the two things that we just decided on, changing the order and, and then September 1. Great. So thank you, Mike O'Neill, for um, dropping everything at a moment's notice and coming to join us in committee. I'm always happy to help and I was babysitting my granddaughter and she behaved very well while I was on. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> didn't, didn't hear any stress in the background at all. None that. at all. Th thank you. All thank right. you, Mike. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Go iron those shirts. All right, so we have um, we have a few minutes. I'm not sure how many. Um, if we want to just push pause for a moment so everyone can uh, can stretch, and then maybe Maxine and I can communicate with Bryn to find out when she will have uh, when she expects to have a final draft. And Jim can go get something to eat. Let's take a 10 minute break right now and with the intention of coming back to do the final walkthrough. We are about to get draft 3.1 up on the committee page. Cool. Uh, Bryn has done some quick work with that. And so yeah. we will just give Andrea a moment to get that posted and invite you all to open it up and uh, start reviewing it. How are you doing? Woo. I, I hear you. And you know, I I really like um, a marathon, but I'm not sure I like a sitting marathon. Yeah, I yeah. I think I'd rather be running for nine hours than <laughs> be sitting here for nine hours. Are you? I think we're almost done. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think uh, uh, I need I. Maybe you don't want to see my face anymore, but my video has been stopped by the host. Um, Mine maybe too. she's, maybe she's yeah. tired of seeing me. Oh, well, I'm a co-host. I can certainly uh, I can certainly get you guys back in business here. Ask to start video. I'm going to ask everybody. Let's get Bryn in. I think you can all start your video, can't you? I still can't. Good to see you, Coach. It's Maxine. How you doing, Maxine? Good. How are you? Oh, geez. We, we had a fun one this afternoon. Am I? All right. Well, I hope. <laughs> uh, I hope you're happy with with what we what we did. Well, it's 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 a uh, it's a step it's it's a step, you know, in the right direction, you know. Um, we had a well, it'll it'll be public. Uh, well, probably as we speak, but it was the uh, a little bit of a. Well, a bit of a civil rights issue with the uh, state's attorneys. Uh, and I think they could have saved themselves a lot of trouble. <laughs> but. <laughs> so absent people um, actually turning their video back on. It's hard for me to know when people are all back from their um, from their 10 minute break. I still can't put <laughs> my video on. Yeah, me either. Or either. Will, I just asked you to start your video. Maybe that's right. not. Okay, there we go. And who else said they couldn't? 
Thank you, Bob. I'm here. Me. Maxine. Okay. Yeah, Maxine yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> the list is so long. Hmm. All right. Coach isn't going to be handing out praise after our second 10 hour day here. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to talk. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Yeah. And the thing, the thing is that, you know, how state government uses uh, teams. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know some people are big fans of teams, but uh, man. <laughs> I, I guess once you get used to using one one format a lot, you just kind of get used to it. Well, teams are great as long as they're not thrown into a box and shaken up. Well, that's what they did to us today. <laughs> okay, so committee, I believe we are still live on YouTube, so I'm going to jump in and invite folks to um, to mute themselves, and we will ask Bryn to take us on a walk through our draft 3.1, which is up on the committee pages. <clears throat> okay, committee. Good afternoon. Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, you should have draft 3.1 posted to your committee page. And I will go through the changes um, that you've made in this version compared to 2.1. Everything should be in yellow. Um, that's new. So as you can see, the first change is in section one, the legislative intent section. We've added the word any. So this act is a continuation of your work over the past several years to create meaningful reforms to address any systemic racism and disproportionate use of force by law enforcement. Second change is on the top Sorry, of the page. Bryn, what, where is the document? In what draft? 3.1 is the draft number and the document. Yeah, it's not on judiciary. It's on GovOps. It's on GovOps, though. Okay. Well, I was didn't know what room we were in. Sorry. Hard to tell. Well, maybe I'll wait for a moment to make sure everybody has it. It's um, three point one recommended by Senate Judiciary. The other three point one at the bottom. Oh right. Yes. Um, because there are some Senate um, drafts in there as well. So you want draft three point one uh, June. 25th, 2020 at 546. Yeah, I got the wrong one. Is everybody feeling like they're comfortable that they've found the right one? Now I have it. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Take it away, Bryn. Okay. So I'm going to move past that first change since that one's pretty straightforward. Um, I'll move on to page two. This is the sort of the bottom of subdivision A, and we've just added the word transparency here. So this act represents one step in the legislature's ongoing effort to combat racial bias and increase transparency and accountability in policing. Okay, and then if, if everybody's got that, I'm going to move on to page three. And now we're in the list of things that um, you've committed to take up um, both in August and beyond. The first change there is in subdivision three, that's new. So it um, says that, you're, that the committees of jurisdiction will evaluate the provisions of section six of this act, which is the new crime. Also 13 VSA 2305, that's the justifiable homicide statute also 24 VSA 299, and that's the statute that um, we talked about briefly before, duties as peace officer. Um, that We talked about it briefly. It provides that a sheriff 
shall preserve the peace and suppress with force and strong hand unlawful disorder. So it says that um, the standing, the committees of jurisdiction will look at these three provisions together in consultation with interested stakeholders to include the attorney general, executive director of state's attorneys and sheriffs, defender general, and executive director of the Human Rights Commission or their designees and revise those provisions as appropriate. Uh, Maxine. Yeah, so so sorry, Bryn. Um, just trying to find where it says uh, committees of jurisdiction because, yeah, can you just, maybe I'm tired and not finding it, but can you show me where it says committees of jurisdiction? Is Actually, it doesn't. It's just provides that the General Assembly commits to working on these things. So it may it may make more sense of, for for that language on the top of page three, lines one and two, um, the general, something about the, the committees of jurisdiction shall work on, or the General Assembly commits to, um, does it matter? I mean, I don't know if it matters, but um, I'm not sure it matters either. Um, okay, all right. This is just a legislative intent section. Um, okay. It's not, it's not necessarily some binding language here. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to subdivision five. This is um, the this is the requirement that the general or the st statement of intent that the general assembly will review the law enforcement advisory board model policy. I also added the ACLU model policy governing law enforcement use of body cameras in consultation with interested stakeholders, including that list of stakeholders that was in the previous draft and developing a statewide policy for adoption prior to the effective date of section six. That should actually read section seven. Change that now of this act. And that is the section that requires that um, DPS outfit VSP with body cameras. So those are, that's the, those are all the changes made in the legislative intent section making a few little edits as I go here. <clears throat> um, the next change can be found on page six. Um, and this is just that small revision to the language about uh, the data, how the data needs to be posted. So we've amended this. So now the data has to be posted in a manner that is analyzable and accessible and accessible to the public on the receiving agency's website and clear and understandable. All right, I don't see any hands up. Okay. Please, please do flag us if there's something that doesn't seem quite right, but that looks good to me. So Jim Harrison. Oh. Bren, can I just go back um, really quickly to uh, page three uh, about reviewing the um, the policy series on body cameras. Is, is anyone coordinating that or is that just a direction for us? It's just a it's just a statement of legislative intent that this these are the issues that you're that the General Assembly is committed to working on um, in the remainder of the 2020 session and beyond. So it, okay. there is no specific directive okay. as to who. Great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tom? Thank you. I should have just stayed outside. No one asked any questions. But um, in uh, line 15 on page six of the and clear and understandable, it, it just didn't flow to me the way that it should have. Uh, would it make more sense to be posted electronically in a manner that is analyzable, accessible, clear, and understandable to the public? Does, does that make more sense and does it flow a little better than uh, just sticking and clear and understandable at the end? Or, or if it's fine, I'm more than happy to 
go you back know, and look old. <laughs> I think this is, this is really up to up up to you guys. I think that I had a suggestion that it um, be posted electronically in a manner that's accessible to the public on the receiving agency's website and be clear, understandable, and analyzable. But I think there are some members that didn't like that as much. And um, so I agree that it doesn't flow perfectly, um, but I don't think it diminishes how understandable that requirement is. Um, I'm good then. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so the next change is on page nine, top of page nine. This is subdivision G. We're in the professional, um, on professional conduct chapter now, and the committee took um, quite a bit, had quite a bit of con conversation around this piece about failure to intervene when another officer is placing a person in a prohibited restraint. So we've just changed the or to an and here. So it's a requirement that um, it's considered category B conduct if a person fails to intervene or fails to report. Um, so you have to do both of those things as, as an officer if you witness another officer placing a person in a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. Okay. So I'm gonna drop down to the bottom of that page now, same page, I'm in section 2407. And we've added to this carve out that, um, that a first offense of excessive use of force under the authority of the state um, is sanctionable conduct by the council. Does that make sense everybody? Okay. So I'm gonna keep going now. I think that the next change you'll see on page 11, which is the repeals section. So this repeals um, that new crime, law enforcement use of a prohibited restraint on July 1st of next year. It also repeals um, that, one, that particular subdivision, subdivision three of the justifiable homicide statute on the same date. And then lastly, we've got the effective dates. So um, section five is the, is the new crime. No, I'm sorry, section five is the unprofessional conduct portion, which takes effect on September 1st. So adding that, um, those, new, those new instances of category B conduct um, and, the, and also the um, carve out for what is sanctionable conduct by the council does, takes effect on September 1st. And mm -hmm. section, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. And then section six is the new crime that takes effect on October 1st. So a delayed effective date there as well. Excellent. Any questions from committee members? Just want to thank you, Bryn. <laughs> Excellent, really. Yes, Bryn, this has been a marathon of a day, and I, I'm sure that there are um, people in your circle who will be happy for you to step away from the computer for the rest of the evening. Well, I'm sure that's true of everybody here. <laughs> um, Mike Merwicki. Um, I'd like to move we accept draft number 3.1 of S219. All right, so we've got two different committees who have to take action. Um, and so if it's okay with you, Mike, I'm going to reserve that to be the government operations committee motion, but I'm gonna to defer to Maxine's committee to, uh, to take the first, uh, the first round of, of making a motion on this. All right, thank you. And, and actually um, it's gonna be 4.1, Bryn, is that true? Because you were making some changes to this? How does that work? Yeah, I made two really technical um, corrections there, correcting a cross reference. So I, it will be 3.1. Okay. All right, great, great. And then, um, so we can go ahead on, and so, cause it still needs to go to the proofers, right? That's correct. So it, has, it hasn't been edited yet. So um, I don't know what your, if the plan is to put it on the calendar for tomorrow. 
Yes. <laughs> are they holding the calendar open for it? Yes. Yes, they are keeping the calendar open. Yeah, yeah. So um, I believe that our editors are, are no longer available. So it, it may just have to go um, unproofed, but um, we can, I can have them proof it first thing in the morning and I can get any corrections that need to be done, done either on the Senate side or through the house um, clerk. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so yes, yeah, so because we, the Judiciary Committee, um, has possession of the bill, um, we would, we would do a vote as a committee, um, correct? And then uh, either simultaneously or after, I don't know how, how we would do this in one big room right now, or if we separate into rooms, but um, House Government Operations would recommend, um, you know, adoption or passage or, or something. Um, yeah, I think it would probably take more time for us to separate into two rooms yeah. to do that than it would if we just sat and waited quietly while you um, okay. went to vote on the bill. Okay. I agree. Great. Yep. Great. Um, be before we do that, I just, I just want to um, thank you and, and your committee um, uh, and my committee as well for for all of your work on this. I mean, this is, I think we did really, really great work. And uh, for me as a chair, it was really, it's really wonderful to be able to watch you, Sarah, and, and, and have, you, have you run the show. And um, I think it's great. So well, I really appreciate it. It has been a wonderful process of being able to listen to the richness of the conversation between the two com committees' perspectives. So I have very much enjoyed being able to um, to being able to work with these committees uh, side by side. So thank you. Maxine, I, I wanna echo what you said also, as far as, uh, you know, working with the two committees, it's um, in the back and forth we had was twice what it usually is because we've got twice the number of people. Um, and, but I also think the compromise was probably, there was twice as much compromise um, and uh, I mean, you know, to be honest, I, I'm not crazy about the new crime, but there was compromises made on it um, and, and uh, a, a lot of compromises, you know, and agreements, I guess you could say that that um, that I find favorable. And um, and before I go any further, I want to thank thank Bryn for all her work. Um, I don't think we've worked this hard on a bill in a, in a long time. Um, maybe, maybe we put in as much time on some bills, you know, recently, but, um, but as far as, you know, getting the amount of work done that we got done, um, was pretty amazing, but, um, and I just want to say, I, I will be supporting this bill. Thank you. So I would entertain a motion to, uh, so, um, so let me backtrack. So would it be, so no. It's not a concur. It's um, just want to make sure I'm getting getting the wording right. Um, just to pass okay. 3.1. I'll make a motion that we concur with further instances of amendment on 3.1 on S219. Does that work? Okay. Right, because it's a strike all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, so, Selena, I see your hand. I don't know if. Um, if, if it's discussion or should we get a second and then have discussion or why don't you go ahead? I I might not have seen your your hand before the. Oh, I, I did have my hand raised just for brief discussion, but um, I can, I'm also happy to second. <laughs> if you're no, I, I want to. Or if you want, whoever wants to second. So, you, okay, I just want to make sure that I, I I failed to see your hand and we moved to um, to put in a motion. So, um, but if you're comfortable doing it with, you know, within discussion. Okay, so, okay, so a second and okay. So, so discussion, Selena, please. Yeah, I was just gonna say, reiterate the appreciation that many people have expressed for the process of um, working collaboratively between the to committees and for Bryn and and really for all our witnesses who came in and give gave feedback and um, I do I am going to support this bill I feel like we did some good work in a short period of time 
and I do appreciate that we heeded the call of a lot of folks in the community who asked us to slow down on a, a lot of things. Um, but I will say that I, I feel a bit with that have felt a bit with this bill. I think we're doing some good and important work here. And I hope, and I think we've done a lot of work to embed kind of future processes and consultative processes um, into our next steps. But it does feel to me a bit like we're sort of fiddling with the knobs of a much of something that needs like really big structural um, change. And so I just, I felt like I had to say that on record that um, you know my support for these provisions um, doesn't preclude doing that necessary and important work. And I think what I heard first and foremost from so many of our witnesses is that we really need to be led and guided in our work moving forward by folks who have been really disproportionately impacted um, by the times when policing has been really harmful to them and their communities. And so I'm really committed to, to that and I hope others are as well. Absolutely, thank you. And I think that is our work uh, in, a, you know, before we come back and, um, and when we come back in August. And uh, absolutely, and I, and I hope that our legislative intent, uh, the message in there gets, gets through loud and clear that we do need to hear from folks who are impacted especially the most um, vulnerable and those who are vulnerable and marginalized and, um, and find a way to hear, hear their voices. Uh, Nader. Thank you. Um, I, I support this bill the way it is right now. And um, some of the, there, there's some additional points that I think actually Selena um, touched on, which is, the, the deeper structures um, in our systems that create a lot of the inequity that we're seeing. Um, you know, it was several years ago, probably halfway through my career as a cop, where I realized, where I started seeing much more clearly that there was a very strong connection between poverty and crime. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about systems that have been in place for a couple hundred years that have just perpetuated this cycle of poverty and crime, and that falls largely on communities of color. And then that also leads to more interactions with the police. So I also, and I don't mean at all to take away from any of the work that we done, we've done today or yesterday, but I also hope that you know, in the future, we'll um, in other committees and in other sessions, we'll also start looking at a lot of the um, systems in place that have kept people um, stratified in the socioeconomic sphere of things. Thank you. Right, right, and we and we also do need to hear um, from the mental health community, and I'm hoping that. Uh, I know in, in the budget discussions, we started talking about having social workers embedded um, in, uh, in police departments, but that's, that's a very, very um, important part of the discussion in terms of who has been impacted. Um, uh, and, and certainly um, folks uh, with mental health, uh, facing mental health challenges or folks that have been, been, uh, been impacted, so. Uh, Tom. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. For, first, I want to say it was uh, it, it was it was good working with my old Irish friend, Mr. O. Wiki, <laughs> because uh, Mike and I spent our, my first four years together on human services, and uh, before I moved to ju judiciary, so it's just nice to be able to work with him again. But on another note, a, a proud dad mo moment. Um, on occasion, just on occasion, my son and I will discuss what we, you know, what we do in, in House Judiciary. And, um, and, and I'm proud to say that um, he has uh, probably more vision than I do, um, but he, he knows that there is a, a need for change. Um, you know, he sees it out in Seattle, you know, even before all the unrest, the recent un unrest, he knows there's a need for change. 
And, um, you know, and he's part of the younger generation on the police force out there that will, uh, that will bring the change forward. So um, the, my proud dad moment. So. Great. Any, uh, anybody else on the committee? Uh, coach, are you, I don't see your hand, but I can't tell if you're trying to unmute yourself or. Yes, there we go. Um, Madam Chair, I, I'd like to thank everyone on the call, uh, both committees. Um, this, this has been a very um, turbulent time internally for me. Uh, I thought COVID uh, put some incredible emotions in place, but then it got stranger. Uh, and especially the last few weeks. Um, but I have to say, and I mean this sincerely, that, you know, we uh, as a state came together, you know, around this legislation. And it's, it's past the point of meaningful. Um, I think we're clearly articulating that we mean to create change. And this particular piece of legislation speaks to that uh, very intently. Um, it, it's a proud moment. You know, like like Tom, um, there's some things that just you know when you know, and you don't know when you don't, and this is one you do. So I I just want to thank you all uh, because it isn't a thing that happens on its own. You know, it, it takes um, a lot of folks, you know, to move. Uh, this kind of a, uh, a change. So thank you all. And I, I'm really proud to be a Vermonter. Thank you, Coach. That, that means a lot. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Barbara has her hand up. Okay, I'm sorry, Barbara. Thank you. Oh, gosh, it's really hard to go after Coach. I'm but um, it's been really terrific working and sort of having both committees work so well together. Um, I wish we did this more because I, it, the wealth of skills that worked on this bill has been incredible. And I feel like we threaded a line very carefully between knee-jerk overreacting and like we have to do something and hearing from people to what really is going to be helpful and make a difference. And it's just been cool being part of that. And um, thank you to all of you. And I know I feel like I want to be brief and not say much more. And a gazillion thanks to Bryn, who has been like unbelievably cheerful in addition to being so um, responsive. So thank you. Okay, anybody else? I just wanna make sure I'm not missing hands. No other hands just up, are up at the moment. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Okay, all right, well, if there's nobody else, um, and so um, Ken is not with us. I don't know if, uh, Tom, do you know if he was gonna come back or I know he had to leave, I, cause I don't know whether um, I could text him and see if he wants to come back and vote. I have no idea. All right. Um, yeah, we, we have I'll one commissioner who's missing right now as well. And uh, and so when we take our straw poll, we will leave that open for him for later. But if you want to reach out to Ken and make sure that he's able to vote if he's able. Yeah, let me reach out to him. And um, why don't we um, start the vote? I'll have um, Nader call the roll. I'll reach out to him. Um, don't want to 
hold anything open too late because our clerks or clerk's office are waiting. But um, but maybe maybe I'll hear back from Ken in the time that you're taking your vote or something. So um, so Rep, I just wanted to request a one minute and just correct what I said earlier. It, this you are voting on draft four point one because I had to remove the watermark and I want it to be very clear that it it's it. Draft 3.1, as you looked at tonight, is going to look a little different than the one you're voting on because there's no draft watermark there. So um, before, okay. you, before you take the vote, vote, and I just emailed it to um, both chairs, so you should both have it now. I don't think I need to amend the motion, but in case I do, it's 4.1. Good job, Martin. <laughs> yeah, no, good to, I was going to ask you to amend it. Okay. Um, Word it to the committee as well, both committees. Thanks, Mike. Sarah, did we want to do a line by line on the new draft? No, oh, I think we probably better. Yeah. <laughs> You're killing me. Sarah, can you uh, mute just uh, to Tom Burdick, please? I'm just just trying to help. You want me to shut his camera off so you can't can you see? You shut his camera off and mute him. That would be great. Mm. We're going to have to have the law about uh, legislators witnessing and interacting, intervening if we see uh, bad. Mm -hmm bad violence or use of force. <laughs> I just want us to be clear, the uh, motion I have is from Maxine and the second I have is from myself. Is that, does that sound accurate? Um, actually, I had Martin making the motion and Selena making the second, doing okay. the second. Good thing I asked. Not I'm happy to let you be second. Not or you were close. I was close, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have Martin as the motion and Selena as the second. Okay, great. Um, are we good to go? Anything else? No, go ahead. Thank you. Christy? Coach, you're muted. Still muted. So Whoop. Yes. <laughs> Holburn? Yes. Ghostland? Machine? Yes. Not? Yes. Rachelson? Yes, with explanation. No, no explanation. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Seymour? Yes. Tully? Yes. Lalonde? Yes. Burdett? Yes. Brad? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I have, I have reached out to Ken. Uh, we will need a reporter. I have some thoughts, but I wanna hear from the committee. Um, people could also think about it and we can turn to GovOps, you wanna do your thing? What, yeah, why don't we go ahead and take our straw poll while, while you guys are mulling over um, reporting since you will have the lead on this. Um, so I have a motion from uh, Mike Merwicki and uh, this is a straw poll, but we'll go ahead and take it by roll. And so Marsha, whenever you're ready. Okay, I am ready, Madam Chair. Diana? Yes. Who did, uh, Ken Smiller? Yes. Mawicki? Yes. McClare? We'll keep the vote open for him. He would okay. like to weigh in. All right. Harrison? Yes. <coughs> Gardner? Yes. Classic? Yes. Hooper? Yes. Brownell? Yes. Colston? Yes. And Kaplan Hansis? Yes. Okay, and we'll hold the vote open for Rob. When uh, should I, can I catch him in the morning? Um, he said he would be in touch with me tonight. Okay. And um, we will, I, I will communicate with you as soon as he does. I, I let him know that we had um, a, a new draft on the committee page. Okay, thank you. So thank you so much. Um, Excellent work all around. Um, Bryn has uh, has ice in her veins and has been just rocking it with all sorts of um, cool
cool competence and patience uh, during a very, very long day. And so um, I would I would suggest that we um, give ourselves a, a little round of applause and get out of here. Thank you, Bryn. And Jim, you're getting off just in time to go have a midnight snack. Right. So um, you got to figure you. out who's reporting because they will need to report to the clerk's office. Exactly. I know. And I have not, um, I'm just, I have not heard back from Ken and I, uh, so anyway, uh, so again, any, uh, sorry, the sun is in my eyes. Um, <laughs> just a good thing. I was wondering, Nader, would you be interested in reporting this? I can do that. Does anyone want to help? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all want to help. <laughs> yeah, in any way that's supportive, that'd be great. But I think, um, I think, given your expertise and contribution, and knowing that you aren't running again, and law enforcement officer um, and the uh, and the respect that you carry with the body. Uh, I think it would be quite, quite meaningful to have you report it. Yes. I think it's a great choice. Thank you, Nader. Thank you. Thanks, Nader. Thanks, Nader. Way to go, buddy. Thanks, Nader. We'll provide emotional support. Great. <laughs> if you need to defer to anybody, uh, defer to uh, Kelly first and then Maxine, because that's what she did to me. Not I'm here for you. Right. All right. Thanks. Right. Yeah, she, you know, right. she did a nice job on the floor the other day. She's a rock star. Yeah, no, thank you. That was, uh, we didn't really know that was going to happen. And good thing no. I was, good thing I was up at three o'clock in the morning checking my email and could start to pull together that report. <laughs> so... <laughs> But yeah, thank you, Kelly. I know, and uh, I wish we could all mail you little notes or something like that. Mm. That's what it's a really nice tradition when people yeah, probably. Yeah. Quick <laughs> question: the draft that I'm reporting is that up right now? On anywhere? Draft four point one. Um, I think it's posted it in order. Okay, thank you. All right, and then um, yeah, and then, Bryn, right, um. Would you be able to do a um, a section by section for Nader? Yeah, I'll send that to I'll send that to you tonight. Thank you. Great. And Great. Thanks. I just wanted to note that the editors are working on it now, so I don't know how much longer the calendar will be open. But if you can wait for like another fifteen minutes, I bet they'll be done. Oh wow, that's excellent. Thank you. Bryn. Yeah. Great. And then Bryn, um, did you see that note? I I did. Thank you. Don't embarrass me though. Hey. Okay. <laughs> And then, um, then Mike, can you please get Nader the witnesses, witness yeah. list, right? <laughs> oh my! I don't think that I don't think that's the bear sound, but <laughs> this is the time of night. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna walk with you, take you guys with me, um, get out of the sun. Okay. Are we? Um, are... All right. So um, I just want to make sure that's not really any better. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm covering all the bases. So, and thank you, Mike, for jumping in here. Uh, so, Nader, you'll have your witness list. You'll have a section by section. Um, rest of the committee members can think about speaking to the bill. Um, Coach, I wrote down what you said. <laughs> <laughs> which was really wonderful. Um, really appreciated that. So anything else? No. Oh. Thank you. Let me just speak. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. For Great sure. Morning, are, are we on tomorrow at 8.30? Oh, thank you. No. No. <laughs> no, you can just leave it tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Yeah. We can go off live and, yeah. uh, and say our good night. Thank you.